The following video is a non-profit historical essay protected under the Fair Use Doctrine of United States law. Fair Use states that it is permissible for the use of limited portions of a work, including quotes, for the purposes such as commentary, criticism, news reporting, and scholarly reports, which is our exact intended purpose here today. This video essay is inherently transformative in nature, with no intention of stealing or taking credit for the works of other individuals. All credit goes to the original producers of said featured content, with direct links provided in the works cited listed below. This historical overview concerns a litany of topics featuring themes intended for audiences at or above the age of 17. These themes include, but are not limited to, racism, colonialism, imperialism, slavery, rape, starvation, war, violence, mass murder, genocide, crimes against humanity, xenophobia, torture, and foul language. Viewer discretion is advised. As we gather tonight, our nation is at war, our economy is in recession, and the civilized world faces unprecedented dangers. Yet, the state of our union has never been stronger. <laughs> North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction while starving its citizens. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil arming to threaten the peace of the world. I will not wait on events while dangers gather. I will not stand by as peril draws closer and closer. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. To threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. Almost two dozen missiles in a single night uh, fired off of both coasts of South Korea. I think this is a result of American weakness because they, they think it is safe uh, to do so. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. The attack by North Korea against the United States, its allies, its partisans, uh, its partners is unacceptable and will result in the end of whatever regime would take such an action. Well, the most, the most common misperception is that, that, that the leadership is crazy and irrational. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, nothing crazy and irrational about trying to, uh, you know, defend your country. I mean, that's totally rational. And, and I think, you know, building nuclear weapons, when you look over, you look out at the world and you see what happened, say, in, in Libya to Gaddafi, when he gave up his nuclear program and then a few years later, U.S. and NATO, you know, displace him in a, in, a, in a war. People in North Korea have the same kind of wants and desires that people all over the world do. You know, to have to, to live in safety and to have a you know, good health system and to, and to have, you know, jobs and income and, you know, water and food, everything. You know, the, 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 the people are no different. As you have probably guessed by the title, viewer, today we are here to investigate a certain country, a country whose infamy and notoriety amongst the international community is well known, a country whose society and culture and people at large are so enamored by the personality cults of its foundational figures that it has deified them and mythologized them to the point of erecting large monolithic structures in their likeness rivaling that of the Seven Wonders of the World. A totalitarian society where the entire population is robbed of all individuality and critical thinking skills from an early age, before being indoctrinated into a highly conformist, atomized, warlike social order centered around praising their exploiters and glorifying their military. 
A heavily militarized Orwellian police state complete with a prison industrial complex harboring millions of non-violent offenders which it regularly subjects to forced labor. A place where show elections are hosted every so often to give the public the illusion of democratic participation and free choice. A rogue nation state of hereditary oligarchs that utilizes its war machine of world conquest proportions to coerce and threaten the international community with wanton hostility, violence, aggression, and even nuclear Armageddon, acting as the world's number one roadblock to peace, freedom, democracy, and social progress. That country, which I have just got done describing to you in detail, viewer, isn't North Korea, but the United States of America. You are probably wondering why, in a documentary that's supposed to be about the DPRK, that I would spend the first couple of minutes describing the United States. For one, it is impossible to discuss the history of Korea outside of the context of a colonial imperialist world dominated by colonial imperialist powers, or in more recent decades, the United States. From the rigging of elections across Latin America, to the overthrowing of democratically elected leaders and CIA-backed coups, to the training and arming of far-right death squads, to actively supporting over 70% of the world's dictatorships, to the non-stop bombing campaigns and military adventurism, to its use of dollar hegemony and economic coercion, within the last century there hasn't been one sovereign nation on earth that has attempted to exercise its right to self-determination that hasn't in some way, shape, or form been relentlessly fucked with by the United States or Western Europe and its allies. The second reason is because this is the description that the liberal media and politicians at large in their oblivious hypocrisy and lack of self-awareness frequently project onto the DPRK. That of a country where people have state-mandated haircuts by law, in which the whole country is simultaneously dirt poor and can't afford to feed its own people while possessing the manpower and resources to maintain the upkeep of a city-sized Truman Show year-round complete with fake grocery stores and paid actors. A place where there is no electricity and where its denizens are required to get out and push their trains around manually by hand. Here it would take like one hour to go to the other place. In order to take a month at least to go because there's no electricity. And sometimes people have to push the train. They have to push the train. Yeah. A culture of militarized fanatics who believe that their leader Kim Jong-il scored 11 holes in one on his first try at a game of golf. That he has no need to go to the restroom. You, you tell me my man doesn't have to take a poo. Does, does he have a butthole? He does not have a butthole. He has no need for one. But how much of this is fact and how much of it fiction? Is it really true that North Korea is this strange hermit kingdom where its general population sincerely believe that their leadership doesn't poop? Or could this claim, among many other claims that have been made about the DPRK over the years by the mainstream media, find their basis in falsehoods, exaggerations, and selected information presented to us out of context as a part of a larger effort by the United States government to demonize the DPRK and fearmonger to the general public as to cultivate popular support for an offensive war of aggression that it has been waging against Korean independence for the last 77 years. This series will be unlike any other that you have ever witnessed before on the subject, viewer, for it is our ambitious task today to provide a comprehensive overview of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, not from the lens of blind apologia, nor from the lens of vitriolic contempt, but from the sobering perspective of critical support. Today you are going to learn about the other side of the story, the side of the story which the powers that be do not want you to know about. What you are seeing on screen now is the timestamp directory. This directory is also located in the description of the video below, so if there is a certain subject which piques your interest that you'd like to learn more about, feel free to skip to the corresponding timestamp. Otherwise, for those of you desiring the complete historical overview of the People's Republic of Korea, it starts right here and now. This is going to be a long one, comrades, so if you plan on watching this all the way through, I suggest you grab a drink and some snacks because we're going to be here a while. Chapter 1. A History of Feudal Korea Korea is one of the oldest countries on Earth. 
with anthropological findings showcasing that the earliest human settlements in the peninsula date back as far as 10,000 years BC. To put things in perspective, the Gobleki Tepe, that is the oldest standing monolith ever erected by humans, dates back to a maximum of 9,000 years BCE. To this day, ancient megalithic structures along with jewelry made from bones and stones alongside primitive hand tools, pottery, plows, and arrows made from obsidian rock can be found at archaeological sites across the country dating back thousands of years. Throughout the millennia, as Korea developed from a primitive Stone Age society into an advanced agrarian society, dynasties have risen and fallen as royal families competed with one another for resources and influence while holding dominion over various fiefdoms across the land. Ultimately, Korea's unification would be achieved in 1392 under the House of Yi, also known as the Chozon Dynasty, whom would rule the Korean Peninsula for the next 500 years, until its spiraling decline during the mid to late 1800s and subsequent collapse in the early 1900s. Korea is a nation that is both blessed and cursed, with plenty of arable land and timber in the south, billions of tons of mineral wealth within the mountains of the north, and an ethnically homogenous population constituting millions of creative, hard-working, free-thinking individuals who share a common struggle and heritage amongst each other. It is for these reasons why the peninsula has found itself subjected to the expansionist policies and ambitions of the colonial powers abroad throughout the centuries. And it was amidst the feudal era that Korea was nicknamed the Hermit Kingdom by the colonizers as to denigrate the country for not only attempting to, but for the most part actually succeeding in insulating itself from imperialist penetration for centuries. Though the Western world wanted a slice of the imperialist spoils, it was predominantly Japan that the Koreans have historically struggled against the most. Between 1592 and 1597, in a war known as the Seven Year War, the Japanese launched a full-scale invasion of Korea, carrying out terror attacks on civilian populations, burning down villages, and indiscriminately killing and raping their way across the country. At the time, Korea was a protectorate of China, paying taxes directly to the Ming Dynasty, and so when word had reached the Chinese emperor that Japan had captured Pyongyang, the emperor had in turn interpreted the attack as a direct threat to mainland China. And so, in order to contain the Japanese and circumvent their march into Manchuria, the emperor sent reinforcements to assist the Koreans. Ultimately, it was thanks to the joint efforts of the Chinese army on land and the Korean navy at sea that the Japanese were successfully beaten back and driven out of the country. Their victory over the Japanese was a furic one, as the Korean kingdom paid a heavy price in the form of millions of lives and the nationwide destruction of their infrastructure. Unfortunately, the peace was very short-lived. Before the Korean kingdom had enough time to fully recover from the devastation brought by the Seven Year War, the Manchu attacks of 1627 and 1637 would commence. These attacks were carried out by rival Chinese ruler Huang Taiji in direct retaliation against the Chozon dynasty for its military support of the Ming dynasty. While the Koreans were successful in repelling the first invasion, the second invasion in particular was especially devastating, as Manchu forces with the assistance of Mongolian mercenaries wreaked havoc on an already war-torn Korea. In the aftermath of the conflict, the Korean king would be forced to capitulate, China would be unified under the rule of Huang Taiji, and from there on out, Korea was no longer a protectorate of the Ming Dynasty. For better or for worse, the Korean Kingdom was now a protectorate of the Qing Dynasty, whom would rule China for the next 270 years. During these periods of strife, property records backing up the feudal order's claim to the land would be lost, which a newly emerging class of proprietary speculators and landlords would opportunistically take advantage of by stealing land from the state. Private owners would steal land from the state due to the lack of property records legitimizing their claim, leading to a loss in available state revenue and a strengthening of said private owners, which would further weaken the state's grip on power and strengthen the private owners even further, etc. Coinciding this paradigm shift in Korea, Japan also saw itself going through a radical transformation of its own. In 1868, the Tokugawa shogunate would be ousted during the Meiji Restoration, leading to the establishment of Imperial Japan. Not long after, Japan would rapidly modernize its military with the help of industrial and technological imports from the West. 
The Maiji government was deeply reactionary, as it had no qualms about brutally suppressing the emerging agrarian uprisings and human rights struggles that were transpiring in the Japanese countryside, as well as reinforcing the dominion and iron grip of the ultra-conservative militant feudal caste. By the late 1800s, the Japanese Empire was a force to be reckoned with, equipped with a thriving industrial economy and an advanced military which it had every intent of utilizing to conquer its weaker, less advanced, and more vulnerable neighbors. In September of 1875, a clash between Japanese and Korean troops would commence on the island of Kangwa. During this conflict, the power disparity between both countries' militaries were on full display, with the Korean forces losing hundreds of men and suffering disproportionate losses despite outnumbering the Japanese by a factor of over 20 to 1. Though they fought valiantly and they fought hard, the Korean forces were no match for the now modernized Japanese, losing hundreds of men to open machine gun fire. And so, in order to maintain the peace and prevent what would otherwise be a one-sided bloodbath should war between Korea and Japan commence, the Koreans had no choice but to sign the Kangwa Treaty of 1876. The Kangwa Treaty was the first in a series of deeply unequal treaties that the Koreans were coerced into signing with Japan, which allowed for the opening up of the Korean Peninsula to Japanese economic penetration, along with ending Korea's status as a protectorate of China. Articles 8 through 9 permitted Japanese merchants and industrialists free reign to access Korean markets and invest, while Article 10 granted Japanese foreigners legal immunity from Korean law and political amnesty for their crimes or abuses conducted upon Korean soil. The treaty also required the Korean government to open three ports facilitating investment and foreign trade in the cities of Busan, Incheon, and Wonsan. Throughout the rest of the 19th century, the Korean Kingdom was repeatedly coerced into signing a number of other treaties and trade agreements which opened the country up to Western imperialist domination and exploitation as well. With concessions being granted first to the United States in 1882, then to Great Britain and Germany in 1883, then to Italy and Russia in 1884, then to France in 1886, then to Austria in 1892 then to Belgium in 1901, and then finally Denmark in 1902. Between the years 1896 and 1900 alone, a number of concessions had been granted to a number of foreign corporations and international investment firms abroad, including, but not limited to, the building of the Incheon Seoul Railroad for United States investors. The exploitation of mines in the North Hamyang province by mining companies based in the Russian Empire the exploitation of gold mines in the North Pyongyang and Kangwon provinces by United States and German mining conglomerates, the exploitation of Korean forests by the French logging industry, and the exploitation of the Chikseong gold mines in the South Chumchong province by Japan. All of this had occurred in the wake of the final defeat of China in 1895 during the Sino-Japanese Wars, as well as the final defeat of Russia in 1905 during the Russian-Japanese War. In the immediate aftermath of the Sino-Japanese War, China was forced to sign a treaty relinquishing control of Korea and ending its status as a Chinese protectorate, stripping the country of what little international protection from imperialism that it had left. During the Russian-Japanese War of 1904, the Russian Empire had contested Japan for control over Korea along with a number of other territories in mainland China. The conflict was ferocious, albeit short-lived, with the Russian Empire quickly crumbling under the might of the Japanese Navy. In one of multiple last-ditch efforts by the Korean royalty to secure something resembling national sovereignty and dignity for their country and people, Emperor Gwangmu signed a treaty with the United States in 1883 with the promise of mutual aid against foreign intervention. The Emperor had hoped that the treaty could be used as a bargaining tool at the international stage with the assurance that the Americans would be legally obligated to help Korea retain its national sovereignty against Japan. Unfortunately for the Korean Emperor, America doesn't exactly have the best track record when it comes to respecting the sovereignty and dignity of non-white people let alone their right to live. In 1905, after the end of the Russian-Japanese War, the U.S. had sent their emissary William Howard Taft to meet with Japanese Prime Minister Katsura in Tokyo to discuss the exchange and partitioning of territory between the two powers. Effectively, 
The United States agreed to recognize Korea as a colony and territory of the Japanese Empire in exchange for some territory of their own in the Philippines, thereby legitimizing Japan's hold over Korea at the international stage. Naturally, Emperor Gwangmu was left out of this meeting. And when Gwangmu sent emissaries to Portsmouth to attend the treaty session in which this exchange was being finalized, President Roosevelt shunted the Korean emissaries from the meeting, doubling down on their decision to outright betray the Korean people, throwing the entire nation directly under the bus and giving the sovereign leader of the Korean government a giant proverbial middle finger and basically telling him to fuck off. In one final act of desperation, the emperor sent his top ambassador, Yi Han Yong, to London in order to broker a deal with the British as to convince at least one of the colonial powers to recognize Korean independence. But by that point, it was far too little too late. For Great Britain was already in agreements with the United States and its other colonial neighbors in their recognition of Korea as a colony and territory of Japan. Upon this revelation, Han Yong, loyal Korean patriot and ambassador who was personally tasked by the last emperor of the Chosun dynasty himself on a diplomatic mission to court international support in order to save his country from Japan, was now overcome with hopelessness and despair for Korea's fate had been sealed. He committed suicide in his office on Trebevere Road in London on the 12th of May, 1905. He was only 30 years old. And it was at this point, with the sovereign leadership of the Korean kingdom no longer being recognized or taken seriously at the international stage, with the Korean emperor being brought to the point of groveling before the feet of the imperialists to respect his country's national sovereignty, with the destiny of Korea being put up on the market and bartered between nations with no consideration for the wants or desires of the Korean people, that is effectively what became the death knell of the ancient regime. By 1907, the emperor was forced to sign a final treaty with Japan, which allowed for the Japanese to directly intervene and supervise within the governance of Korea, and by 1910, Emperor Gwangmu was ousted from power, and the collapse of the Chosun dynasty was now complete. The Korean people were now completely at the mercy of the Japanese imperialists. Chapter 2 Under the Boot of Japanese Colonialism The Korean army was disarmed, uh, and then in 1910, Korea actually formally became a Japanese colony, far-reaching and negative uh, effects for the Korean people who lost their national rights, their independent rights, they couldn't use uh, the Korean language. That was actually forbidden. It was an offence uh, to uh, use the Korean language under Japanese colonialism. And the Japanese plundered the country of resources. They took uh, away huge amounts of resources. Uh, they even uh, stole tableware from the Korean people. And they brutally exploited the Korean people. Uh, people were forced to work 12, 14 hours a day in Japanese industries. A lot of Korean people were forcibly taken away to Japan to work in the munitions industry. Uh, again, working very long hours, very dangerous work. Uh, you know, it was about eight, eight million Korean people were taken away. One million Korean people were killed under Japanese rule. Uh, you know, it was like a hidden holocaust. Uh, you know, everybody talks about um, Germany uh, and what the Nazis uh, did. Uh, but there's, I think, a lot of ignorance about Japanese colonialism, Japanese imperialism, Japanese fascism. Because never forget that Japan was an Axis power allied to Germany and Italy. Uh, you know, people overlook these crimes of Japanese imperialism. Uh, and... Also, the Japanese took away 200,000 Korean women as sexual slaves and forced them into the most degrading sexual slavery ever. Uh, and they've never apologised for it, ne never paid uh, compensation, not that any amount of money could really compensate for that kind of crime. I did actually, in the early 90s when I visited the DBRK, speak uh, to one or two sort of uh, pe uh, people who were, you know, quite a bit elderly and, you know, were alive in the period of Japanese rule in Korea. And it was it was pretty horrendous. Uh, someone told me that uh, they were at school, they accidentally spoke in Korean and the Japanese teacher made them stand on a chair 
for the rest of the uh, whole, you know, the rest of the school day. So, you know, that's uh, uh, what uh, it was like to live under Japanese rule in Korea. As alluded to by Dr. Hudson during the onset of Japanese colonialism, a kind of cultural genocide was taking place. Korea was renamed Chosun and declared a property and territory of the Japanese Empire. All Korean political organizations had been liquidated. Korean newspapers and public gatherings were disbanded. The school system was Japanized, as Korean children were forced to take on Japanese names, speak Japanese, and worship Japanese gods. And at the height of Japan's war with China, students were forced to recite the following pledge. Quote, we are subjects of the Empire of Greater Japan. We unite our hearts in striving to give loyalty and service to the Emperor. We will learn to endure hardships and be strong, upright citizens." End quote. Though Japan had made substantial strides in modernizing its economy, by the early 1910s they were still lagging considerably far behind the West. And so, in order to close the gap, Imperial Japan utilized a process of colonial accumulation in order to enrich itself and meet the needs of its own growing economy at the direct expense of Korea. Once Japanese colonization was complete, they would set about restructuring Korea into an export-oriented economy that was wholly dependent on Japan in order to function. In 1906, Japan would introduce private property rights along with implementing a reactionary policy of land reform. This included the nationalizing of all of the former territories of the Korean Kingdom before privatizing and selling them off to Japanese settlers and corporations on the cheap cheap. Japanese land ownership swelled during this period, going from less than 2,000 property owners possessing 87,000 hectares of land in 1910 to 10,000 owners possessing roughly 200,000 hectares of land, a trend which continued throughout the 1920s and 1930s. Under the feudal system, the Korean peasantry didn't really have a concept of land ownership in the ways that we are familiar with here in the West, as there were no legal structures in place declaring the legitimacy of one's ownership of a given plot of land. Instead, there was an unspoken honor system in place where if a family had inhabited a given plot of land for some generations, that they were perceived by their neighbors and members of the community at large as the rightful owners and inhabitants of that land. After all, they and their family members have been living and dwelling and working upon that land for decades, possibly centuries, so who cares if they don't have a piece of paper declaring it so? In reality, virtually all of the land was the property of the feudal barony, and though there were a minority of blue-blooded royalty that were in charge of Korea, their style of rule was incredibly indirect, laxed, and hands-off as they oftentimes passed their administrative responsibilities off to their representatives known as the Saum. The Saum were a kind of middleman between the peasants and the barony whom would arbitrate over the common folk on their behalf and work to settle disputes whenever they would arise. The Saum routinely permitted the peasants to voice their grievances and to operate with a great deal of decentralized autonomy. In general, the feudal rulers didn't really mind what the peasants were up to at a local level so long as they paid their taxes and respected their rule. And so, the Korean peasantry greatly benefited from this very laxed, decentral, and autonomous, hands-off style of rule. The peasantry also benefited a great deal from the services and protections offered by the old legal system as well. Since the land was effectively the property of the state, the peasantry in turn had the benefit of a legal guardian protecting them from privatizations and enclosures. At the same time, Highly skilled artisans and handicraftsmen were guaranteed economic security since the feudal state directly subsidized them by acting as a permanent customer for their goods and services. But now, with that legal infrastructure gone, with the end of the decentral, autonomous, and hands-off type governments of the feudal system, the peasantry were now completely at the mercy of Japanese enclosures and privatizations. Millions of Korean peasants were violently driven from their homes under the waves of Japanese privatizations and enclosures, being forced to abandon their ancestral lands which they and their forefathers lived and worked upon for centuries. Practically overnight, millions of Koreans were transformed into propertyless, poverty-stricken wage laborers. Many were forced to migrate into the cities in search for work, while those who remained in the countryside became landless tenants and farmhands, laboring beneath Japanese landlords, big agribusiness, and large private estates. And in the wake of the introduction of monetary economics, the doors had been opened to money lending, usury, land speculation, and the hoarding of rice. 
With the collapse of the Chozon dynasty and the introduction of the monetary system, the independent, highly skilled, and self-sufficient artisans and handicraftsmen were wiped out and ruined. Since without the existence of the feudal state as a permanent customer for their goods, these small-scale producers were forced to sell their goods on the market. Unable to compete with big business, the artisans were put out of work and forced to become wage laborers themselves. Practically overnight, Korea was transformed into a major rice exporter, as Korean farmers were compelled by high rents, debts, and taxes to sell their rice at a discount rate to the Japanese. Oftentimes, in order to pay off their rents, debts, and high taxes which they owed to the landlords, lenders, and Japanese government, it was not uncommon for Korean farmers to be forced into selling their entire harvests and being left with nothing for themselves. From 1915 to 1938, Korean rice consumption per capita had steadily declined over the course of its status as a Japanese colony, as the vast majority of its rice was shipped off to Japan, with none being left over for domestic Korean consumption. And it didn't end with agriculture. Virtually every aspect of Korea's economy had been restructured towards the needs of the Japanese Empire without any consideration for the needs of the Korean people. Korea's development had been deliberately stunted, and what little economic growth was transpiring was only being done in the pursuit of facilitating the raising of the rates of exploitation on the Korean proletariat. Part of accomplishing this task involved the development of Korea's transportation infrastructure and manufacturing. Railways were built ports were established, and factories were constructed with the intent of increasing the rate of Korean exports to Japan. Nothing better exemplarizes Korea's status as a Japanese colony producing exclusively in accordance to the needs of its parasitic host than the fluctuations in its mining industry. Between 1920 and 1922, as well as between 1929 and 1931, there was a fall in both the value as well as the production rate of Korean mining products as illustrated on the following table. Both of these contractions in Korea's mining industry directly correspond with the global recessions that took place at those times. The Japanese had less use for Korean mining products, and so they exported less of them. On the other hand, corresponding to Japan's militarization of the mid to late 1930s, the value in Korea's mining industry increased from 22 million up to a peak of 150 million yen by 1937. At the same time, exports of Korean gold were used to fuel Japan's imports of iron, oil, copper, and other materials from the United States. And then in 1941, when Japan was cut off from the world market due to their alignment with the Axis powers, Korean gold production declined and its mining machinery was dismantled for use during the war. During World War II, the Japan-Korea-Manchuria Resource Mobilization Plan was drafted and introduced, with the intent of once again repurposing Korea's economy towards the needs of Japan's war machine by aggressively tapping into the country's reservoir of cheap labor and resources, while at the same time further increasing Korea's dependence on Japan. Heavy industry goods, textiles, chemicals, household utilities, clothing, furniture, and a number of other goods were being produced exclusively in accordance to the needs of Japan. By the end of World War II, Korea was producing virtually nothing for itself and everything for Japan, and what little industry it had left was fundamentally incapable of operating independently without external support from the Japanese. Quote, Industry in Korea was such an integral part of the economy of Greater Japan that most of the industrial plant existing in Korea at the end of the war was incapable of independent existence. For capital goods, Korea relied almost wholly upon Japan, and certain important stages in the production of consumer goods also depended on Japanese parts or supplies. Light bulbs were fabricated in Korea, but the tungsten filaments used in these bulbs were manufactured in Japan. Even though Korea was a large producer of tungsten ores, the ore was shipped to Japan to be refined and manufactured into wire, which was then shipped back to Korea for the production of light bulbs. In summary, it may be said that the development which took place during the period of Japanese rule in Korea hardly constituted a Korean economy. Koreans appreciably shared neither in the direction of this development nor in its benefits. The Korean economy was Japanese owned and Japanese directed and in no sense an entity in and of itself, but rather the geographical location of a portion of the wider configuration of the economy of Japan, end quote, Mikun Korea Today, pages 33 through 34. Japanese colonial rule was barbaric, 
Living conditions deteriorated for the vast majority of Koreans. Workdays averaged north of 12 hours, as every member of the family had to be employed full-time in order to survive. The bulk of the Korean population owns nothing for themselves, and all of the land that they once dwelled and lived upon had become the private property of Japanese and Korean landlords. And to make matters worse, the Japanese routinely utilized forced labor without payment in the construction of their roads, railways, bridges, military bases, ports, and so on. And while at war with the Chinese, the Japanese conscripted young Korean men and boys to be used as cannon fodder on the front lines. And when the Koreans protested, as they oftentimes did, the Japanese government responded in every single instance with the utmost cruelty and brutality, violently putting down the uprisings via mass arrests, beatings, and the wanton massacre of thousands of unarmed civilians. By the 1930s, living conditions were so intolerable that tens of thousands of Korean families were forced to live in exile in Manchuria, including none other than Kim Il-sung himself. Chapter 3 Anti-Colonial Resistance in the March 1st Movement Since the very arrival of the Japanese in the year 1905, the Korean people were engaged in active resistance, as patriotic insurgents comprising the remnants of the Korean Kingdom's army took to the streets and to the countryside and actively engaged in armed struggle. Between 1905 and 1910, Guerrilla bands numbering in the tens of thousands were actively involved in hundreds of military skirmishes and clashes against the Japanese. These uprisings were highly spontaneous and decentral in nature, and it was thanks to this lack of collective cohesion and coordination that the Japanese were able to decisively defeat the insurgency. Though the Korean patriots fought hard and they fought well, the Japanese occupational forces proved themselves to be more than a match for the insurgents. And as the first decade of the 20th century came to a close, the Japanese army succeeded in breaking the first guerrilla movements and initial wave of uprisings for a time. Over the course of this five-year period, an estimated 30,000 Korean insurgents died fighting Japanese troops. In the wake of their crushing defeat, the surviving remnants of the original guerrilla movement were forced into exile in Manchuria, where they would forge an anti-imperialist alliance with the communist Chinese in the 1930s, and then joining forces with the Soviet Red Army against the Axis powers during the 1940s. The defeat of the insurgent movement did not mark the end of the Korean people's struggle for national liberation, however. As upon the death of the old emperor in 1919, protests had spontaneously erupted once more. With the hope of capturing international attention and support, unarmed peaceful demonstrations and gatherings took place in which the Koreans protested against Japanese occupation. This action became known as the March First Movement. Uh, at the time, uh, there was a nationalist movement, but it was primarily led by bourgeois nationalists. Uh, they believed in uh, peaceful means to get national independence, uh, and they were also uh, split among factions, and uh, like the feudal ruling class before them, had the idea of trying to involve uh, outside powers, big powers, to try and get their independence. Suddenly, and without warning, an extraordinary thing happened. On the afternoon of March 1st, 1919, 30 of the most prominent Koreans in the country, having signed a proclamation of independence, sent a copy to the Governor General with their compliments. After this, the central police station was called, the action explained, and the men awaited arrest which followed as soon as the astounded officers could arrive. While being driven to prison, great crowds cheered from the streets. The people by this time were fully aware of the nature of the occasion. For at 2 o'clock, special copies of the proclamation had been read by appointed delegates in public places all over the country. The immediate spread of peaceful demonstration over Korea was phenomenal and clearly the result of a carefully planned program. How such organization was achieved unseen by the eyes of the Japanese secret police soon became one of the most incredible aspects of the whole situation. The population action consisted primarily in meeting at a predetermined point, marching down the streets shouting, Mons, the ancient national cheer. Until dispersed by police, the completely national character of the demonstrations was shown by the fact that nobles, scholars, and preachers, children and aged, male and female, walked side by side. Some policemen who worked for the Japanese changed into civilian clothes and joined the crowd, stores and schools closed. 
and economic life came almost to a standstill. Cornelius Osgood, The Koreans and Their Culture, page 285. Unfortunately, no such international support ever came, and in response to the widespread protesting, the Japanese government brutally cracked down with violent terror, beating up large crowds of unarmed protesters, jailing tens of thousands of participants, burning down entire villages in the countryside, and killing untold thousands of people. And President Kim Il-sung uh, realized uh, that you couldn't achieve uh, independence by peaceful means or, you know, people sort of writing petitions or, or, or even strikes, you know, that they needed to be armed struggle. Uh, at the same time, he also realised you couldn't uh, get independence by trying to sort of ask outside forces to help you. Uh, independence had to be achieved independently by the efforts of the Korean people. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, a series of militant strikes and demonstrations took place, from the 1929 general strike in Wonsan that for several months had brought industrial activities to a grinding halt, to the 1930 worker strike in the Sinhyung coal mine, to the peasant raids on Japanese police stations in Kanchun County, to the widespread rioting and demonstrations across Hamgyong, Kangwon, Julia, and Pyongan provinces, to the Autumn Harvest Riot and the Spring Famine Riots that took place in the countryside, amidst this period of widespread struggle, the Korean Communists had entrenched themselves deep within the heart of the National Liberation Movement, and would successfully outcompete the bourgeois nationalists for influence, in effect winning the heart and soul of Korea. Chapter 4 Enter Kim Il-sung, the Korean Revolution, and decisive defeat of Japan. In addition to the widespread protesting, striking, rioting, and various uprisings transpiring back at home, the struggle against Japanese colonialism was also occurring abroad in the province of Manchuria. As many of the Korean exiles had joined forces with the Chinese and formed anti-colonial guerrilla bands in the countryside. Though the Korean exiles were a minority in Manchuria, they nonetheless proved themselves to be a formidable ally fighting alongside the Chinese on numerous occasions and even participating in the Long March, in which the People's Liberation Army under the leadership of a young Mao Zedong were decisively defeated by the Kuomintang and forced to retreat for thousands of miles deep into the Chinese countryside between the years 1934 and 1935. Manchuria was the principal region in which the Korean exiles participated in anti-imperialist struggle, and it was here that Kim song jus rise to prominence would occur. Kim song ju or more commonly known as Kim Il-sung, was born in 1912 under Japanese colonial rule in Korea. Kim and his family were farm workers, and as was the same story with countless other displaced Korean peasants that were now toiling on private farms and estates, Kim's family worked very long hours for meager wages, going to bed hungry every single night with not a dime of wealth to their names. Reportedly, Kim was radicalized from an early age as his father would tell him stories about Lenin and the October Revolution, and both of his parents were direct participants in the March First Movement as well. The adolescent Kim was a first-hand witness to the cruelty of the Japanese, as his father had been arrested, his mother had been flogged, and his house was torn apart and searched by the police. And so given the general economic precarity, the harsh living conditions, the widespread starvation, and excessive cruelty suffered at the hands of the Japanese authorities, Kim and his family were one among many families to emigrate to Manchuria in the 1920s since life effectively became impossible in their homeland. Kim spends most of his adolescence and early adulthood in China, attending the Wasung Military Academy in 1926 and the Yu Wen Middle School in 1927. At the age of 17, Kim became a member of an underground Marxist reading club. When the local authorities found out, he was arrested and sent to jail in 1929. When he got out of jail a year later, he dropped out of middle school and joined the Chinese Communist Party. And by the age of 18, he was a full-fledged guerrilla engaging in armed struggle against the Japanese imperialists and the reactionary Kuomintang alike. On the 30th of May in the year 1930, Spontaneous peasants uprisings erupted all across eastern Manchuria, as was the case with the initial wave of guerrilla rebellions that broke out prior to the March 1st movement. The uprisings were unplanned, disorganized, and discoordinated. Four months later, the Mutkin incident occurred, 
in which a small dynamite explosion had been set off near a Japanese railroad. The incident was then used as provocation by the Japanese to enforce their holdings and establish a puppet dictatorship in Manchuria. In the wake of these repressions carried out by the Japanese, this is what Kim Il-sung had to say about the May 30th uprising, along with his proposals to his fellow cadres to better organize and consolidate the masses. My speech at the meeting was edited and published under the title, Let Us Repudiate the Left Adventurist Line and Follow the Revolutionary Organizational Line. In this speech, I mentioned the two tasks I set on leaving for East Manchuria. At the meeting, we analyzed and reviewed the true nature of the May 30th uprising and put forward the revolutionary organizational line of uniting the whole nation into political force by firmly rallying the masses of workers, peasants, and intellectuals and banding together the anti-Japanese forces of all other social sections around them. The meeting discussed the tasks for the implementation of this organizational line, the tasks of building up a hard core of leadership and enhancing its independent role, of restoring and consolidating the ruined mass organizations and enlisting people from all walks of life in them, of tempering the masses in the political struggle, and of strengthening the joint struggle of the Korean and Chinese peoples and promoting their friendship and solidarity. At the same time, the tactical principles were laid down of advancing from small-scale struggles to large-scale ones, and from economic struggles gradually to political struggles, and of skillfully combining legitimate struggles with underground ones, with special stress being laid on the matter of thoroughly overcoming the left adventurous tendency. Kim Il-sung, with The Century, page 210 to 211. And thus... The young Kim Il-sung would go on to founding the anti-Japanese guerrilla army in the early 1930s. The anti-Japanese guerrilla army was a contingent of guerrillas comprised of Chinese peasants and Korean exiles alike, whom would fight alongside the People's Liberation Army at the Manchurian border, as well as actively working to arm and mobilize the peasantry. The young guerrilla commander would go on to play a pivotal role in the coordination of the war efforts, leading a series of successful skirmishes against the Japanese throughout the mid to late 1930s. The most famous of Kim's exploits occurred in the year 1937, when Kim Il-sung led a raid onto the stronghold of Pachambo, in which under his leadership, the communist guerrillas decisively defeated the Japanese and destroyed their local government in the region. The attack on Pachambo took place on the 3rd of June late into the evening. At 25 years of age, Kim held the 6th Division of the Anti-Japanese Guerrilla Army under his command. This division constituted some 200 guerrillas, whom would carry out this attack on local government buildings occupied and controlled by the Japanese. Kim Il-sung reminisces on the day of the attack and its significance to the broader struggle for national liberation. Quote, At 10 p.m. sharp, I raised my pistol high and pulled the trigger. Everything I had ever wanted to say to my fellow countrymen back in the homeland for over 10 years was packed into that one shot reverberating through the streets that night. My signal started a barrage of fire destined to destroy the enemy's establishments in the city. The main attack was directed at the police substation. Opaque Ryung's machine gun poured out a merciless barrage of shots at its windows. As we knew that the enemy was also gathered at the forest conservation office, we struck it hard as well. The town turned upside down in an instant. Order lies came running out one after another to report to me the developments of the fighting. To the each of them I stressed that no civilians were to be hurt. The sub-county office, post office, forest conservation office, fire hall, and various other enemies' administrative centers were engulfed in flames, and the streets were floodlit like a theater on a gala night. While searching the post office, some of my men found a lot of Japanese coins in a tin box. As we withdrew from Bochambo, they tossed them around in the street. Opaque Ryong broke into the police substation and came out with a machine gun inscribed, presented by the Patriotic Women's Association. He looked delighted at the find. People began to gather on the street from every corner. When they first heard the gunshots, they kept indoors, but later, when our agitators began shouting slogans, they came pouring out in a throng. Poet Jo Ki Chung described the scene by saying, Quote, the masses were swayed like a nocturnal sea, unquote. Looking round the crowd, I found their eyes bright as stars, all focused on me. Taking off my cap and waving my uplifted arm, I made a speech stressing the idea of sure victory and resistance against Japan. I concluded with the words, quote, Brothers and sisters, let us meet again on the day of national liberation, unquote. 
The battle was a triumphant event in that it dealt a telling blow at the Japanese imperialists, whom had been strutting around Korea and Manchuria as if they were the lords of Asia. There was no doubt whatsoever that the outcome of this battle would make a great impact on the world. Korea, a lesser nation that had once exposed the crimes committed by Japan and begged for independence at an international peace conference, suddenly revealed itself to possess a revolutionary fighting force capable of dealing merciless blows at the army of Japan. The Battle of Bajambo showed that imperialist Japan could be smashed and burnt up. The flames over the night sky of Pachambo in the fatherland heralded the dawn of the liberation of Korea, which had been buried in darkness." Unquote. Kim Il-sung, With the Century, Volume 6, page 165 to 168. In the months following, word of this attack would reach Korean soil, elevating the morale of the domestic Korean resistance movement bolstering popular support for the communists, as well as catapulting Kim Il-sung's popularity to mythic proportions. As many of the strikes, revolts, and demonstrations that would transpire back on Korean soil were inspired by the heroic tales and exploits of the anti-Japanese guerrilla army under the leadership of Kim Il-sung. By the late 1930s, a full-fledged resistance movement had emerged. The Korean peasantry and proletariat, now emboldened by the actions and accomplishments of the anti-Japanese guerrilla army, spearheaded the charge on the domestic resistance movement throughout the course of World War II. Otherwise, the Japanese weren't too happy about having their local governments in Pachambo burned to the ground and destroyed, and so in the year 1940, the Japanese retaliated by sending death squads into the countryside to hunt down Kim Il-sung. And on top of that, the Japanese also took a Korean woman hostage whom they suspected of being Kim Il-sung's wife. When they learned that she wasn't his wife and actually had no relationship with Kim whatsoever, instead of letting her go, the Japanese opted to instead have her executed in cold blood, regardless of the fact that she was an unarmed civilian that was completely uninvolved in the entire thing. Kim Il-sung was now a wanted fugitive of imperialist Japan whom were now actively combing the Chinese countryside in search for the young Red Army lieutenants along with some 200 guerrillas under his command. Despite the best efforts of the Japanese army to track down Kim Il-sung, Kim and his forces proved themselves to be highly elusive, as they were always one step ahead of the Japanese at every turn during their escape, whether they were hidden deep within the wilderness or hiding in plain sight amongst the peasantry. In the end, Kim and his guerrilla forces escaped the Japanese, crossing the border into Russia on foot and making their way into the Soviet Union. Under the protection of their communist allies, Kim and his men would be rearmed and retrained by the Soviets before being appointed to the 88th Separate Rifle Brigade under the command of Zhu Baozong. Under the 88th Separate Rifle Brigade, Kim and his men would fight alongside the Soviets throughout the course of the Second World War, all the way up until 1945 when they finally made their return back home to Korea. At long last, on the 12th of August, 1945, the Soviet Red Army, alongside the Chinese and Korean guerrilla forces led by Kim Il-sung, would march into Korea from Manchuria. The Japanese, recognizing that their final defeat was imminent and that they stood no chance against the combined forces of the Soviet Union, the Chinese, and the Korean exiles, proceeded to immediately rout, making their way towards the south as to await the arrival of the U.S. military. All along the way, the Japanese, being the spiteful, sore losers and vindictive pricks that they are, would go out of their way to deliberately sabotage any and all industrial equipment, burying machinery, destroying infrastructure, flooding mines, breaking tools, and sacking entire factories for the simple reason that they didn't want the Koreans to have them. Needless to say, after 25 years, Kim Il-sung and the Korean guerrilla exiles under his command had finally returned home being welcomed back and venerated as war heroes by the Korean people. Chapter 5 Foundations of the People's Republic of Korea Liu Woon Hyung was one of the leading organizers behind the Korean independence movement since the onset of Japanese colonialism. He was a populist Christian socialist who had played an integral part in the formation of the original provisionary government of Korea in 1919. From the March 1st movement and onward, he courted political support from the left and the right in the pursuit of Korean independence. In 1921, he convened with Leon Trotsky and Vladimir Lenin in Moscow to discuss Korean independence. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, 
Liu was actively involved in anti-Japanese, pro-independence political activities, from running an independent newspaper by the name of Changgang Daily News, to being an active member of the Illigo Koryo Communist Party. Over the course of his revolutionary activities, he would be repeatedly arrested and spend much of his time in and out of jail. In the final years leading up to the end of World War II, in anticipation of the imminent defeat of Japan, he founded the Korean Independence League, as well as the Committee for Preparation of Korean Independence. While organizing the People's Republic of Korea, by his side stood two fellow Korean independence organizers and socialists by the name of Hyohan and Pak Han Young. Hyohan was a lawyer who grew up in Korea but studied abroad in Japan at the Maiji University Law School. Throughout his tenure as a lawyer, he frequently represented and defended Korean independence activists, labor organizers, and Communist Party members, working tirelessly to get them the lightest sentences possible whenever he couldn't outright get them off the hook. While lawyering is traditionally a very lucrative profession, Hyohan made an incredibly poor salary since, as it turns out, there is little to no money to be made in defending communists and socialists, and so in a desperate need for more income, he picked up work in the mining and real estate industries. In 1945, he was arrested by Japanese authorities for his suspected involvement in an illegal radio broadcast, being locked up and tortured for two years until he was freed in 1945. Upon his liberation, he joined the Committee for Preparation of Korean Independence as well as the Workers' Party of Korea. Pak Han Young is yet another pivotal figure in anti-Japanese resistance, attempting to organize the earliest Communist Party in the years that followed the March 1st movement. In 1922, he was arrested by Japanese authorities for being a suspected Communist organizer, and then released in 1924. In 1926, he was arrested yet again, but was released shortly thereafter when he convinced the Japanese authorities that he was criminally insane, after he reportedly ate his own feces in his jail cell. Throughout the 1940s, Pak Han Young was an active independence organizer in the South, and was in direct correspondence with Kim Il-sung while he was still in exile in Manchuria. Though Kim Il-sung and Pak Han Young were close friends and allies for the longest time, they would inevitably have a falling out at the end of the Korean War, which would ultimately lead to his arrest and execution, for his leading role in a failed military coup that was planned to oust Kim Il-sung. We will touch up on the nature of this coup as well as the subsequent purges that followed, but for now, it's still 1945, and we have a great deal more history to discuss. Liu Wun-hyung, Hyo Han, and Pak Han Young were the leading figures in the movement for Korean independence, having a direct hands to play in agitating and organizing the masses against their colonial oppressors, and were all leading figures in the Workers' Party of Korea. Together, they would speak for the law and the land and establish the People's Republic of Korea on the 6th of September 1945. The People's Republic of Korea, or the PRK for short, was the original provisionary government that formed immediately after World War II. Its president, ironically enough, was Syngman Rhee. The PRK was comprised of hundreds of people's committees, or workers' councils akin to that of the Soviet workers' councils in the USSR. In virtually every town, city, or village, there was at least one people's committee in which workers and peasants alike participated in elections and collective decision-making. And it was these working-class organizations that had formed from the grassroots that constituted what was originally supposed to be the official governing body of Korea. Though the original PRK was not exclusively a left-wing government, but rather a coalition of political tendencies united in the pursuit of Korean independence, leftists made up the lion's share of its seated delegates, as out of the 87 original elected representatives in this provisionary government, half of them were either socialists or communists. Hard times under fascist dictatorships will by design compel people towards political views centered around freedom, collective solidarity, and liberation. And nothing is more liberatory than freedom from poverty, unemployment, sickness, hunger, and racism, a set of conditions which the Korean people were all too familiar with under Japanese rule. For these reasons, the politics of nationalism and socialism gravitated well towards one another and became irrevocably interlinked within the context of pre-revolutionary Korea. And so what originally started off as a national liberation movement eventually took on an increasingly communist character as the years went by. And so what happened to it? Where is the People's Republic of Korea today? <laughs> 
Why is it that there are instead two separate governments ruling two separate Koreas rather than a single unified Korea under the governance of the PRK? The answer will shock you. Chapter 6 Korea is split in two. Democracy in the North, dictatorship in the South. To get an idea of what both superpowers had in store for Korea after the Second World War, one need not look any further than the first messages delivered to the Korean people by the Red Army in the North and the United States military in the South. Here is the first message delivered to the Korean people by the Red Army's own Colonel General Ivan Chistikov. Quote, Korean people, you have attained liberty and liberation. Now everything is up to you. The Soviet Army will provide all conditions for the free and creative labor you are bound to embark on. Koreans must make themselves the creators of their own happiness." End quote. And now, let's take a look at the first message delivered to the Korean people by the U.S. military's very own General Douglas MacArthur. Article 3. All persons will obey promptly all my orders. Acts of resistance to occupying forces or any acts which may disturb public peace and safety will be punished severely. Article 5. For all purposes during the military control, English will be the official language. End quote. From the tone being set from these first two messages alone, I think we can get a general idea of what both superpowers had in store for Korea in the years following World War II. At the end of World War II, the United States government requested that the Soviet Union would cease its advance beyond the 38th parallel, a request to which the Soviets would honor as the two powers were still immediate post-war allies. The 38th parallel was the boundary that was decided upon by the U.S. military during the Potsdam conferences in the summer of 1945. Originally, there was a post-war agreement between the USA and USSR that this dividing line would only be temporary, and that once the war was over, both the United States and the Soviet Union were to withdraw their presence from the country and allow the Koreans to form their own provisionary governments. Between 1945 and 1947, the Soviets and Americans met multiple times to discuss the formation of this new government. America, in its desire to control Korea's resources and transform it into a strategic hardpoint against the Soviets, sought to reinstall the Japanese fascists to power. Surprisingly enough, the Soviets were actually willing to compromise with the U.S. on this, so long as the U.S. were willing to compromise themselves and allow communist representation from the Workers' Party of Korea to be allowed in this new government, a request to which the United States heavily objected. Not long after, relations between the U.S. and the USSR began to rapidly deteriorate, and all of a sudden, it became highly inconvenient for America to honor the post-war agreements that it had made to leave Korea after the war. For to do so would mean potentially acquiescing control of the strategic hardpoint that it had been eyeballing for decades to the communists. After Japan's route from the north into the south was complete, the United States immediately permitted the Japanese to retain all of their pre-war governmental and administrative posts, despite the many crimes they had committed against the Korean people. In August of 1945, General MacArthur saw to it that the Japanese commanders retained their positions, stating that, quote, Communists and independence agitators are plotting to take advantage of the situation to disturb peace and order. It is directed that you maintain order and preserve the machinery of government south of the 28th degree until my forces assume those responsibilities. And thus, instead of facing any sort of retribution for their crimes, the United States welcomes the Japanese in the south with glee, reintegrating them back into the military, the secret police, and various state machinery in the dictatorship to come. Korean lawyer and independence activist Lee Kang-kook, whom is referenced by American journalist Anna Louise Strong in her work titled, In North Korea, A First Eyewitness Report, gives his first-hand account of the immediate post-war formation of the PRK and the political developments that followed suit. Quote, After the surrender of Japan, we organized people's committees and set up local provisional governments all over Korea. We made no division between the North and the South, for the Americans had not yet come and we did not know that they would suppress us. On September 6, 1945, three weeks after the surrender of Japan, we held our first Congress in Seoul, of about 1,000 representatives from all parts of the country. 
They had been chosen quickly and without full formality, but they were a fair representation of all of the political tendencies in Korea, except the pro-Japanese. We took the name Korean People's Republic and set up a People's Committee of 75 members to hold provisional power and prepare for general elections. We even chose the very reactionary Syngman Rhee as chairman because we knew that he would be the American candidate, and we wanted unity with all of our allies. Rhee came to Korea then in an American plane, waited around to see what the Americans wanted, and then decided to repudiate our People's Committees and rule as dictator with American aid. The split was not immediate. Not only the first provisional governments, but the first political parties and civic organizations, trade unions, the Farmers Union, the Union of Youth, the Women's Union, formed first on a nationwide base. These organizations became, in the North, the centers of political life and the basis of government. In the South, they were suppressed and attacked by right-wing terrorists, assisted by the Japanese-appointed and now American-recognized police. Today, there are some 20,000 political prisoners in the American zone, twice as many as under Japan. I myself had to flee to the North to escape. It is well that I did, for our beloved leader, Liu Woon Hyung, head of the Farmers Party, who remained in the South and cooperated with the American-installed government, was assassinated by right-wing terrorists a month ago in 1947." Unquote. In the end, the U.S. military quite literally never left. Unlike the Soviets, whom actually honored the post-war agreements by letting Korea form its own government and then leaving shortly thereafter, America proceeded to violate the original terms of the post-war agreements by opportunistically filling the power vacuum while outlawing the People's Republic of Korea in the South. Shortly after the arrival of General Hodge in Seoul, the U.S. Army erected a large military base in the southern capital, establishing themselves as a permanent presence in the country and then proceeded to consolidate a new government of their own making known as the Republic of Korea. The First Republic of Korea, or the ROK for short, was comprised of a combination of the U.S. military, the remnants of the imperialist Japanese, and Korea's extreme right-wing colonial collaborators. They outlawed the Workers' Party of Korea and the People's Committees, forcibly broke up and dissolved the indigenous provisionary governments in the South at gunpoint, forcing the Southern PRK and WPK into the underground, brutally repressed hundreds of thousands of Korean patriots, imposed their iron-fisted rule via martial law, upheld and reinforced pre-war colonial property relations, and installed Syngman Rhee in a farcical show election. Syngman Rhee was a right-wing bourgeois nationalist who had been an active participant in Japanese resistance during his early life, but he would be arrested and imprisoned by the colonial government in the late 1890s. After his release, he emigrated to the United States and spent most of his life living in Hawaii and attending university there. In 1904, he earned a degree in political science and had the privilege of meeting President Theodore Roosevelt. From there on out, Rhee paid frequent trips to Washington and would forge his political ties to the U.S. Deep State. During the March 1st movement, Rhee became a League of Nations mandate. Rhee's status as a mandate of the League of Nations meant that he was the pre-selected candidate whom the Western colonial powers plans to legitimize as the leader of Korea should Korean independence from Japan be achieved. And Syngman Rhee was the perfect guy for the job. He possessed all of the qualities and attributes that America longs for in its puppet dictators. He was a Christian fundamentalist, a right-wing nationalist, a United States sycophant, and most importantly, a fervent anti-communist. Chapter 7 Korean Patriots Fight Back The Taegu Rebellion, April Uprisings, Fascist Terror, and Show Election of Sigmund Rhee After decades worth of lived experience under the boot of colonial rule, the South Korean proletariat had fully recognized the reality of the situation. That the United States was not here to liberate, it was here to maintain colonialism and capitalist economic relations with zero regard for the independence or the desires of the Korean people. Between 1946 and 1949, a series of uprisings would commence that would sweep across the entirety of the Republic of Korea. These uprisings, which involved the active participation of hundreds of thousands of Korean workers, were being orchestrated and carried out by the now underground People's Committees, the remnants of the PRK, as well as the Workers' Party of Korea. Since the reactionary governments had outlawed these democratic institutions above ground legally, they opted to continue their work underground extra-legally. 
Liu Wun-hyung and Pak Han-young alike were at the forefront of the South Korean resistance movement, organizing various acts of anti-imperialist resistance throughout this period. In autumn of 1946, a countrywide general strike would commence. This general strike was carried out by the Korean Federation of Trade Unions and involved the active participation of up to 300,000 workers across the metal and chemical manufacturing industries. The strike was declared illegal by the U.S. military dictatorship and outlawed. And in order to put down the strike, the military dictatorship resorted to sending thousands of armed soldiers to Seoul to violently repress the uprising. An eight-hour street battle would commence, with the U.S. military and the Korean mob on one side, and the protesters led by the Korean Federation of Trade Unions on the other. During this clash, three protesters would be killed, and hundreds more injured. Over in the city of Taegu, in which protesters and strikers were also active in the struggle, the police shot and killed one member of the crowd. In the aftermath, the strike participants gathered the body of their fallen comrade and carried them through the streets of Taegu, rousing the ire of the general populace and lighting the match of resistance that would spread across the country like wildfire. The Taegu Rebellion had now begun. Though the initial uprising began in the city of Busan, the Taegu Rebellion got its name due to the spontaneous resistance movement that had emerged in the city as a result of the police killing that had taken place there. As a result, the resistance movement in Taegu joined with the ongoing movements in Busan before spreading to Seoul and then making its way across the Gyeongsang and Jolia provinces as well. Railway workers, textile, electrical workers, and farmers alike participated in wildcat strikes, protests, and widespread rioting across the country, with hundreds of thousands of workers in active participation against what they rightfully recognized as a neo-colonial dictatorship. In some instances, armed military excursions between Korean guerrillas and the military dictatorship would take place in the streets, in which patriotic insurgents would clash with the police and the military as well. Despite the formidability of the United States military and the massive power gap between them and the domestic resistance movements, their efforts alone were not enough to suppress and quell the uprisings. So the United States military courted additional support from the remnants of the Japanese Empire, as well as Korean nation traders, imperialist collaborators, and fascist gangsters alike in order to put down the uprisings by force. And so they brought in ghoulish characters such as Kim Doohan and Park Chun-hee to get the job done. Kim Doo Han was a prominent South Korean mobster turned fascist nation trader who made a career out of breaking up strikes, carrying out far-right acts of terrorism, and murdering communists, labor organizers, and independence activists as well. Doo Han had deep ties to Korea's criminal underworld, being the leader of the Jongro street gang during the period of Japanese colonialism, and after the end of World War II, he became one of Syngman Rhee's prominent anti-communist attack dogs. During the eight-hour street battle in Seoul, Duhan led thousands of fascists and strike breakers against the strikers and independence activists led by the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions. After the Korean War, he was elected treasurer of the National Assembly, and in the 1960s, following the coup and ousting of the Second Republic of Korea, he was reintegrated into the state machinery of the Third Republic of Korea under the Park Chun-hee military dictatorship. Park Chun-hee is yet another unsavory figure brought in and carried over into the new governments by the U.S. military. During the period of Japanese colonialism, he was a member of the Japanese army who studied and trained in Japan, and fought for them in World War II. Park himself was an imperial romanticist who glamorized the Japanese empire and more positively identified himself with Japan than he did with Korea. During his years of service in the Army of Japan, he was recognized for his talents as a skilled officer and quickly rose through the ranks to become the General of the Empire of Japan. After Japan's surrender and defeat following the end of World War II, he was integrated into the state machinery of the First Republic of Korea, being one of the leading officers in the Korean National Police, or KNP for short. And after Syngman Rhee was ousted in 1960 during a peaceful democratic revolution, he would seize power in the following year in a military coup, ousting the Second Republic of Korea and establishing the Third Republic of Korea, being the figurehead of a new US-backed puppet state that was just as ruthless and repressive as the last. In addition to unsavory figures such as Kim Doo Han and Park Chun-hee, the US brought in the remnants of the Japanese governments to be integrated within South Korea's military and secret police. Hand in hand, the US military, with the assistance of the nation traders and colonizers, would proceed to heavily repress the Taegu Rebellion, 
beating and brutalizing protesters, massacring crowds of unarmed participants with live ammunition, and jailing countless tens of thousands to be re-educated in the Bodo League concentration camps. Though the rebellion was repressed for a time, the South Korean proletariat fought on. A second wave of uprisings took place in an event known as the April 3 Incident, which lasted from April of 1948 to May of 1949. In a similar manner to the Taigu Uprising, the April 3 Incident would begin on Jeju Island, but would then be joined by several towns and villages across the mainland, including Posang, Kwanyang, and Polkyo once again involving the active participation of hundreds of thousands of Korean patriots. The military dictatorship's response to these uprisings mirrored the brutality of Imperial Japan. During the Jeju Island Revolt, the South Korean dictatorship indiscriminately killed anywhere from 30,000 all the way up to 60,000 people. At the time of the incident on April 3, 1948, the area was crowded with police stations and detention camps, where mass slaughters were perpetrated. 247 people are so far known to have died in this area. However, based on testimonies that killings were conducted every day, the number of victims appears to be much higher. Identifying the whereabouts of those who are unaccounted for is also a pressing task. Some 5,000 people on the island are believed to have gone missing at the time, but how and why remains unknown. Government support is urgently necessary for a state-level investigation into the Jeju massacre, whose many facts remain in the dark even after 70 years. Between the years 1948 and 1950, Syngman Rhee had north of 300,000 suspected communists and northern sympathizers imprisoned and enrolled in his re-education system known as the Bodo League, a concentration camp of sorts where the prisoners would be brainwashed to hate their own country and to love colonialism. Between the years 1946 and 1943, the South Korean government, with the blessing and assistance of the United States, would carry out a series of mass killings, including but not limited to the Bodo League Massacre, the December Massacres, the Gangwa Massacre, the Jiocheng Massacre, the Goyang Cave Massacre, the Namayangju Massacre, the Nogunri Massacre, and the Sangchun Hamyang Massacre. In each one of these incidents, Thousands of suspected Korean patriots and communists were summarily rounded up and shot and then dumped into mass graves. After the many decades that followed, all of the victims' family members were terrorized into silence, history was rewritten, and North Korea was blamed for all of these massacres. In 1948, the Korean national security law was enacted and enforced, which effectively made communism illegal, outlawed the recognition of North Korea as a political entity, and criminalized the distribution of any material that could be interpreted as too pro-North or too anti-South for the government's liking. The national security law is, in every sense of the term, thought crime. For all of the criticism and scathing condemnations that the DPRK faces from liberals because it allegedly locks people up for voicing the wrong opinions, this is exactly what the ROK has done historically and still does to this day, as one cannot be too vocal about the wrong sentiments in the South without risking serious jail time. As the era of the Cold War and the Red Scare started to ramp up, the political wedge between the United States and the Soviet Union continued to be driven even further, as by 1947, in the wake of the founding of the Soviet-American Joint Commission on Korea, an organization established with the intent of helping both nations to reach an agreement for peaceful unification for the whole peninsula, no such agreement was ever reached. Instead, the United States decided to go to the United Nations and found their own diplomatic institution behind the backs of the Soviet Union and the DPRK called the Temporary Commission on Korea. And despite the fact that the Temporary Commission on Korea was actively refused entry into North Korea, despite the fact that the Temporary Commission on Korea was never recognized by North Korea as an institution that legitimately represented their country and people, despite the denunciation of this commission by the Soviet Union, the commission was recognized by the UN, and their stamp of approval is all that mattered to the West. And so, despite opposition in both the North and the South to the US-founded commission, 
the UNTCOK, or Temporary Commission on Korea, would go on to hosting a forced show election with the intent of legitimizing Syngman Rhee's rule and creating the veneer of democratic popular support. Three weeks prior to the U.S. orchestrated poll, the Koreans organized a national unity conference in Pyongyang, which featured hundreds of elected delegates representing towns and cities across the North and the South alike who publicly denounced the impending election of Syngman Rhee. I repeat, during this conference, the democratically elected candidates representing the Korean people universally denounced this election and demanded that America allowed for both Koreas to participate with a chosen candidate of their own and that America should honor its original agreements that it had made to the Koreans to leave the country. The United States proceeded to ignore the demands made by this conference and pushed forward with their election anyways. It was on the 10th of May in 1948 that the election of Syngman Rhee took place. Political parties all across South Korea, from leftists to centrists and even some rightists, had boycotted the election and heavily criticized the South Korean government for hosting a separate election that excluded the North Koreans' ability to participate in the vote. The widespread sentiments across the spectrum was that a South-exclusive election would permanently divide the country in two and dash any hopes of Korean unification. Turns out they were right 70 years later. On the day of the election itself, the entirety of South Korea's economy was paralyzed by a nationwide general strike. Communists and nationalist insurgents alike went to work disrupting the elections, protesting and carrying out acts of terrorism. Amidst the striking and protesting, the election itself had to be hosted and enforced through martial law. South Korea's secret police force, which was teeming with Japanese fascists, frantically maneuvered to break up the strikes and protests and to guard the voting booths. Out in the countryside, the secret police coerced and intimidated rural communities into turning out to vote, threatening to take away their homes and food rations if they didn't participate in the election. Between March 29th and May 10th, nearly 600 people died over the course of the anti-election protests and riots, including 60 police officers, 40 government officials, and 330 protesters. In the end, Syngman Rhee secured over 90% of the vote from electorates representing over 75% of eligible voters. Naturally, the United States and its allies declared the election a symbol of freedom and democracy, and with respect to the election's integrity and authenticity, there is a highly compelling case which can be argued that the election of Syngman Rhee is not an accurate representation of the will of the Korean people when you consider that one. Over 30% of the population that inhabited the Northern Hemisphere was deliberately barred from participation. Number two, the incredibly loud and vocal opposition stemming from the North and South alike. Number three, the incredibly violent and coercive atmosphere surrounding the day of the election itself. Number four, the fact that the Temporary Commission on Korea was created and imposed by the UN Security Council as the de facto arbiter over the election without the consent or involvement of the Koreans or the Soviets. And number five, the abysmal ratio between electoral observers and voters making the potential for electoral fraud incredibly likely. Let's talk about that last point in regards to electoral observers. As a general rule of thumb, the more observers that you have presiding over an election, the more integral that that election should be, at least in theory, since you have more individuals on the lookout for attempts being made to flip votes, stuff ballot boxes, dump ballot boxes, and otherwise defraud the election. But there are a number of problems with the Temporary Commission on Korea. The first being that none of its members are Koreans. They're all Western partisans that were handpicked by the UN. Furthermore, the commission only had about 30 members who were tasked with presiding over an election in a country of about 20 million individuals. And even though each member of the commission had teams of observers working underneath them, there was still a colossal disparity between the voter to observer ratio at an estimated 14,000 to one. To put things in perspective, during the SAR plebiscite referendum of 1935, in which 90% of participants inhabiting the SAR basin voted to reunify with Nazi Germany, the Nazis wanted to see to it that the SAR status referendum passed because it would have a allowed them to reincorporate the SAR basin into Greater Germany and b legitimized Hitler's campaign with the veneer of popular democratic support. During the SAR status referendum itself, the estimated voter to observer ratio was about 500 to 1, and that was for an election which UN observers and liberal historians alike often regard as highly dubious and controversial, given the Nazis' widespread use of violence and intimidation 
in order to coerce voters to turn out while ruthlessly repressing any and all opposition. The election of Syngman Rhee bore a striking resemblance to the SAR status referendum with respect to the looming shadow that was being casted by his dictatorship in the wake of the elections, along with the Nazi-like tactics he used to legitimize his grip on power. Chapter 8 The Election of Kim Il-sung and Formation of the DPRK in direct response to the show elections being hosted in the South and the proclaimed legitimacy of the Republic of Korea by the West, the North Koreans hosted an election of their own, which unlike the South, was a countrywide election featuring all Koreans both above and below the 38th parallel. It is also worth mentioning that there were no mass riots or striking or protesting taking place across the North, nor was there any widespread violence, police terror, or intimidation transpiring in its wake. While hundreds of people died protesting the election of Sing and Rhee, the number of people who died protesting the election of Kim Il-sung is an astounding zero. The election was cast through a secret ballot in which reportedly 77% of the eligible South Korean and 98% of the eligible North Korean populations participated. This election produced 360 Southern delegates and 212 Northern delegates, amounting to a total of 572 delegate members of the National Assembly most of whom met in Pyongyang in September of 1948. The delegates in the National Assembly represented workers from hundreds of residential districts across the entirety of the peninsula, while the Assembly itself constituted a coalition of diverse political tendencies sharing a common vision of a unified Korea. From the Workers' Party of Korea, to the Chandaoist Changu Party, to the Democratic Party, to the Laboring People's Party, to a slew of other independent parties constituting all 572 heads of the assembly. During this historic election that took place in August of 1948, Kim Il-sung was elected the premier and the head of the newly founded Democratic People's Republic of Korea, while the Workers' Party of Korea won 157 out of 572 seats at the assembly. Shortly after the election of Kim Il-sung, the Red Army honored the post-war agreement and took its leave from North Korea. It is important to note that though Kim Il-sung was the officially endorsed candidate of the Soviet Union, that he was no puppet dictator. On the contrary, Kim was a freedom fighter who had become a national icon of resistance and liberation long before being elected leader of the DPRK. And the DPRK itself was comprised of the remnants of the original PRK that had formed immediately after World War II. Unlike in the South, where the indigenous governments was violently forced into the underground, the northern government was actually allowed to persist and consolidate itself from the grassroots along the lines of Korean national unity, anti-colonial solidarity, self-sufficiency, and socialist economy. In this way, the DPRK is, for all intents and purposes, the rightful and legitimate government of the entirety of Korea, being comprised of the remnants of the original People's Republic of Korea. And Kim Il-sung is the true, lawful, and legitimate, democratically elected leader of the country while the Republic of Korea is an illegitimate colonial puppet regime that was fabricated into existence and imposed on the South at gunpoint by Japan and the United States. Chapter 9 The Foundations of Korean Socialism From Agrarian Reform to Superindustrialization After the end of World War II, the North began its reconstruction and developmental path along the lines of a socialist economy. Contrary to the notion of a top-down autocracy that enforced its will at gunpoint, the working masses had a direct participatory hand to play in the process of socialist construction. As workers and peasants alike were organized into thousands of people's committees and federations spanning the countryside, at the governmental level, the country was led by a coalition of political organizations including the Workers' Party of Korea, along with the Women's League, the Democratic Youth League, a number of nationalist and religious organizations, and numerous peasant federations which would be tasked with carrying out agrarian reform, labor reform, economic reform, as well as increasing the level of enthusiasm and participation among the working masses in the construction of socialism. The government in the North was comprised of a highly diverse coalition of political tendencies and schools of thought. American journalist Anna Louise Strong discusses this ideological diversity in her own first-hand account in 1949. Quote, Believe it or not, there is no Communist Party in North Korea. It was rather a shock to me to discover this, for the American press cannot refer to this area without labeling it all as Communist. The Democratic Party, 
smaller in number but containing many prominent intellectuals and businessmen, was quickly formed. For a time, the largest party was the Farmer's Party, but its organization was neither disciplined nor clearly defined. It merged with the Communists to form the North Korean Labor Party, which is by far the largest party now. The second largest party, the Chendo Guo, is based on a religious sect peculiar to Korea. It is a humanist religion that developed in Korea before its subjugation by Japan. It proclaims that I am God and you are God, and we should behave as such. The Chendo Guo is a democratic religion, since Koreans are as much God as the Japanese are. It was the Chendo Guo that led the famous and naive pacifist revolt in 1919, when hundreds of thousands of Koreans rushed through the streets in white robes, proclaiming Korean independence and telephoning to the Japanese police that Korea was independent now. They were shot down by guns. The Chendo Guo has thus its heroic tradition of martyrs. Most of the political prisoners under Japan were either Chendo Guo or communist. In an interview with one of the participants who took part in the DPRK's elections, Louise Strong has a back-and-forth discussion with a Korean woman who provides some important insights into the truly democratic nature of North Korea's electoral system. Quote, In November 1946, North Korea held its first general elections. The Chendo Guo, Democrats, and Korean Workers' Party formed a democratic front and put up a joint ticket. The single slate ticket so criticized in the West. I argued with the Koreans about their electoral system, but they seemed to like it. 99% of them came out to vote, and everyone with whom I talked declared that there was no compulsion, but they came because they wanted to. I discussed the question with a woman minor. Did you vote in the general election? I asked. Of course, she said. The candidate was from our mine and a very good worker. Our mine put him up as a candidate. I explained the Western form of elections. What was the use of voting, I argued, if there was only one candidate? Her vote could change nothing. We all knew the candidate. We all liked him. We all discussed him. The political parties held meetings in our mines and factories and found the people's choices. Then they got together and combined the best one, and the people went out and chose him. I don't see what's wrong with this or why the Americans don't like it. The voting technique was simple. There was a black box for no and a white box for yes. The voter was given a card, stamped with the electoral district. He went behind a screen and threw it into whichever box he chose. The cards were alike. Nobody knew how he voted. Of course, not all elections were single candidate elections, by which the vote itself was merely a final verification process, since the candidate itself had already been heavily discussed, criticized, and evaluated by the group with respect to their qualifications and positive attributes beforehand. In some towns and villages, multi-candidate elections were hosted, in which up to a dozen candidates' names were present on the ballot box. This electoral model, however, was considered by many Koreans to be inferior to the final verification method of voting as explored again by Anne Louise Strong in her personal account. Quote, the black and white boxes were also used in the village competitive elections. In one village, there were 12 candidates, of whom five were to be chosen for the village committee. Each voter was given 12 cards, bearing the names of the candidates. He then cast his chosen ones into the white box and the rejected ones into the black. What prevents him from casting them all into the white box, I asked. Nothing at all. But in that case, he is voting against himself, for his votes do not advance any candidate beyond the others. He can do exactly as he likes. He can put as many as he likes into the white box, as many as he rejects into the black box. And if he wants to, he can take some of the cards home with him, without either voting for them or against. If he has a single very strong choice, he will vote for one and against eleven. This strengthens his single vote. By giving black to the rest, he can vote for three or for six or seven, instead of five. The law of mathematics ensure that he weakens the strength of each vote if he votes for more than five. When all the ballots are counted and the white checked against the black, we get the exact preference of the villagers. I was intrigued by these village elections, which seems to me exact and subtle in expressing the voters' choice. The Koreans with whom I talked, however, considered them rather primitive. To them, the single slate put up by agreements between the parties, and then ratified or rejected by the people, was a more developed form. 
They argued that it was more likely to secure the best representatives in government, since the candidates were first widely discussed in public meetings and then examined by the leaders of all the parties before finally being proposed. Under the pass or reject Soviet electoral model, if the candidate has made it as far as being listed on the ballot box in the first place, it is because that individual has already been heavily evaluated and appraised by the entire Workers' Council with respect to their individual qualifications and attributes. The vote itself is little more than a final step of verification in this process. Keep in mind that under this system of voting, all elected officials are subject to scrutiny and can be recalled from their posts and replaced with a new candidate if the collective has deemed that this individual has not done a good job representing their interests in this way, it is much easier for elected officials under socialism to be held to account by the constituency beneath them, should they not fulfill their roles or obligations to a T. Compare this system to traditional bourgeois democracy, in which elections are little more than a popularity contest between which capitalist-funded partisan can best pander to the constituency and manipulate them for their vote, and then once elected, can't be held to any sort of democratic account, as elected candidates are under no legal obligations under law to uphold any of the promises that they have made to the constituency on the campaign trail. Journalist Anna Louise Strong continues with her account. Quote, This government's faced many bitter problems. The problem of food. North Korea was a land of mines and heavy industry that had not fed itself for decades. It was deprived of food by its separation from South Korea. The problems of industry. All Korean industry had been tied to the Japanese war industry and had also been thoroughly wrecked by the Japanese before their surrender. The problem of education. There must be schools in the Korean language, which had been discouraged under Japanese rule. Under the dynamic leadership of Kim Il-sung, who had fought the Japanese for 14 years in the mountains north of Korea, the People's Committee accomplished a whirlwind program in a year. The land reform of March 1946 transferred more than half of the lands of North Korea to new ownership, unquote. Anne Louise Strong in North Korea, a first eyewitness report. By the time the North was liberated by Kim Il-sung in 1945, Korean society had become deeply class stratified, especially in the countryside, with landlords making up 4% of the population while owning almost 60% of the land and the peasantry, making up 57% of the population, only owning 6% of the land. And so the first order of affairs included the implementation of the Lands Decree of March of 1946. Article 1. The land reform in North Korea arises from historical and economic necessity. The mission of land reform lies in the abolition of Japanese land ownership, land ownership by Korean landlords, and the land tenancy and bestowing the right to exploit the land on those who cultivate. The agricultural system in North Korea shall be founded on individual ownership by farmers who are not shackled to landlords. Article 2. The land coming into the following categories shall be confiscated and transferred to the ownership by farmers. 1. Land owned by the Japanese state, Japanese individuals, and organizations. 2. Land owned by traders to the Korean people, those who have damaged the interests of the Korean people, and who have actively participated in the political machinery of Japanese imperialism, and also land owned by those who fled from their own districts at the time of the Korean liberation from Japanese oppression. Article 3. The land in the following categories shall be confiscated and distributed freely for ownership by farmers. 1. Land owned by Korean landlords in excess of 5 cho per family. 2. Land owned by those who do not cultivate but rented land solely for tenancy. 3. All land, regardless of acreage, which is continuously in tenancy. 4. Land owned by shrines, temples, and other religious sects in excess of 5 cho. From there on out, some 12,000 rural committees were tasked with registering the land, tools, draft animals, seeds, granaries, irrigation systems, and buildings in preparation for confiscation, expropriation, and eventual redistribution. The plan factored for both family sizes and the quality of land. With a hard limit of 5 Chongbo, or 5 hectares, per farm being set since 5 Chongbo represented the upper limit of how much land that a single individual could reasonably work and cultivate food upon. Within 20 days time, 
the rule committees had successfully expropriated nearly a million Changbo worth of colonial properties and private land holdings from some 44,000 proprietors before redistributing them among 720,000 landless peasants. During the summer following the agrarian reform, the labor reform was enacted, providing the Korean proletariat with a slew of protections and entitlements that were previously completely unheard of, including, but not limited to, an 8-hour workday for adults, a 6-7 to seven hour workday for teenagers and those engaged in hazardous occupations, the abolition of child labor, legally fixed holidays, two weeks paid time off by law, something we still don't have here in the United States of Freedom, and roughly three months of paid time off for pregnant women. Article 18 of the Labor Decree established an extensive social insurance system designed to do the following. Number one, aid for temporarily disabled workers. Two, aid for the period of vacation due to pregnancy and childbirth. Three, aid for funeral expenses. And four, paid sick leave as well as medical leave for those injured on the job. The Labor Decree also established a hard rule of equal wages for equal work as to abolish the gender pay gap and time and a half wage payment rates for all work performed on off days and holidays. Once the People's Committees were ready and the implementation of land reform and labor reform was complete, the DPRK was finally ready to lay the groundwork for socialist planning. By 1947, the North had brought 80% of its industrial sector under state control. Mining, along with railway transportation, communications, foreign trade, and the banking system were all nationalized and made public property. And a number of factories and facilities, which had been deliberately sabotaged by the Japanese, had been completely restored and made fully operational once more. President and Secretary General Kim Il-sung discusses the success of this first economic plan in his report to the People's Assembly in 1948. Deputies, the economic plan for 1947, the first of its kind in our nation's history, has been splendidly overfulfilled in all respects by the creative efforts of the liberated Korean people. Success in the implementation of the plan marks the first big stride in laying the foundations of an independent national economy to ensure the freedom and independence of the country and national prosperity. The plan for rehabilitation and development of the national economy for 1947 adopted on February 19th of last year at the Congress of the Provincial, City, and County People's Committees was successfully carried out by the working people under the correct leadership of the government bodies at all levels. In the field of industry, the factories and power stations demolished by the fleeing Japanese imperialists and the flooded coal and ore mines were extensively rebuilt last year. The blast furnaces and coking ovens at the Honghei Ironworks were restored and put into operation by our own efforts. Though the fleeing Japanese technicians had maintained that the Koreans would be unable to reconstruct it by themselves. In 1947, the state-run industry's total output value exceeded the plan's targets by 2.5%. Industrial production last year increased more than 70%, and industrial labor productivity 51%. The power and electric engineering industries overfulfilled their agreements by 37%, the coal mining industry 5.2%, the chemical industry, 7.3%, the building materials industry, 9.6%, and the light industry, 0.4%. The output of ammonium sulfate, which is essential for the development of agriculture, more than doubled as of August 1946, and locally run industry overfulfilled its plan by 25.4%. The success in industrial rehabilitation and development over the past period is a clear indication that our people are fully capable of building an independent industry by their own efforts if they strive with all their wisdom and talent." End quote. Kim Il-sung, Report of the Fourth Session of the People's Assembly of North Korea, February 6, 1948. Did South Korea implement any sort of land reform of this scale and scope? <laughs> nope. On the contrary, the ROK upheld and reinforced colonial and private property relations after the Second World War, allowing the Japanese and Korean collaborators to keep their sizable land holdings, means of production, and privately owned estates. And the only reason South Korea did implement any sort of land reform later on was thanks to the fact that when North Korea initially invaded, they initiated socialist land reform, and the policy was so overwhelmingly popular amongst the rural population that Syng Min Rhee had no choice but to maintain it to a limited extent during and after the Korean War.
So even when land reform did come to the capitalist south, it was as a direct consequence of the efforts of the communists. And so even when capitalism does it right, you have communism to thank for it. How about labor reform? Did Syngman Rhee standardize the 40-hour workweek or fair and equal wages for equal work? Fuck no, he didn't. Average workdays in South Korea are still to this day notoriously lengthy as hell. And women and farm workers in particular were known for having to work north of 60 plus hours a week on a regular basis just to make ends meet. How about inflation? Did the ROK implement sensible financial reform to regulate inflation rates? Psh, absolutely not. Inflation rates were practically a built-in feature of South Korea's economy throughout the Cold War. How about democracy? Was the Republic of Korea democratic? Hell no. The original Republic of Korea had to be installed by the United States at the barrel of a gun, and it took multiple revolutions before the South Korean proletariat won bourgeois democracy as a concession in the late 1980s. Chapter 10 How the South Started the Korean War On the 25th of June, 1950, the North Korean army launched a full-scale invasion into the South, attacking the South with 80,000 troops and capturing two towns along with all of the territory to the northwest of the Imjin River. In the wake of this, Western sources would have you believe that this attack was an unprovoked act of aggression. As a matter of fact, that's the official narrative adopted by the South Korean government and the United States government when the initial attack happened. To this very day, American high school history classes will teach you that it was the North who were the aggressors and that America's intervention into the war was necessary to stop the evil communists from taking away South Korea's freedom. The fact of the matter is that the Korean War began much sooner than the 25th of June, 1950. It actually began the very moments that America arrived in Seoul in 1945. There'd been a plan for some time to invade the DPRK and in fact uh, as President Kim Il-sung himself pointed out that the Korean War didn't start in 1950 it started a long time before uh, and basically from 1947 uh, the South Korean puppets uh, made raids uh, into the northern half of, the, uh, of Korea which had become the DPRK in 1948 uh, and by 1949 uh, that year alone, they carried out about 2,000 border raids. As noted by Dr. Hudson in the year 1949 alone, the South Korean army and police perpetrated over 2,000 documentable instances of armed incursions onto Northern Territory, including kidnappings, murders, pillaging, and arson. Leading all the way up to the war, there had been numerous border clashes all along the 38th parallel between the North and South Korean troops. Prior to the war, in April of 1948, a joint conference of political parties and organizations was hosted in Pyongyang, which was a historic joint conference featuring representatives from virtually every political party and mass organization from both the North and South Korea, with the intent of reaching an agreement to peacefully unify Korea. All of the delegates in attendance, representing the virtual entirety of Korea's political spectrum, unanimously agreed that peaceful unification and patriotic struggle were the desired policy outcomes. However, Syngman Rhee had no intention of agreeing to peaceful unification within such a context, since he had a deeply unpopular puppet government to maintain. In his New Year message in 1949, he said the following, Up to now, in the view of the international situation, we have pursued a peaceful policy. We must remember, however, that in the new year, in accordance with the changed international situation, it is our duty to unify southern and northern Korea by our own strength. And in his August visit to Washington, he made it clear that his agenda was to The march on the north is the most important task. And the following year, he delivered a speech on a U.S. military flagship where he spoke of, quote, the unification of Korea with help of armed forces. If we have to settle this thing by war, we will do all the fighting that is needed. I would wage war, but for this, American help is needed. Syngman Rhee even boasted on a number of occasions that in a war with the North, that he could capture Pyongyang inside three days' time, provided he had the support from the Americans. Uh, originally, uh, the US had planned for South Korea to invade the DPRK, but because of the weakness of the South Korean armed forces, 
they they scrapped it uh, well revised it and put it back later what uh, happened was that in January 1950 there was a, a pact or agreement concluded between the US and South Korea uh, the US agreed to arm South Korea to give them a lot of military aid uh, there was a US military advisory group in South Korea which had command over the South Korean puppet army the uh, US National Security Council met in April 1950 and it was there that the uh, final order to start the Korean War was drawn up and in the run-up to the beginning of the war uh, John Fuster Dulles uh, you know brother of Alan Dulles and actually visited South Korea he was there one week before uh, the war broke out and uh, although you won't, it's hard to find this uh, picture uh, in the Western mainstream media or in academia. Uh, he actually visited the 38th parallel, the front line area between the DPRK and South Korea. And there's a picture of him looking at a map, finalizing the war plans. And he made an extremely provocative uh, speech uh, to the South Korean uh, so-called National Assembly. I uh, can't remember the exact words, but uh, it was basically, to paraphrase it and simplify it, was something like, oh, we're, we're right behind you. Whatever you do, we're right behind you, sort of thing. Uh, that was sort of like a green light for South Korea to attack. Dulles uh, then went to Tokyo, where he met uh, uh, several uh, US commanders and uh, political figures. Uh, I think Omar Bradley, you know, US Chief of Staff was one of them. I think MacArthur. And from the 23rd of June, uh, the South Korean puppets started shelling uh, the areas uh, north of the 38th parallel. And then very early in the morning of uh, June 25th, uh, they actually attacked the DPRK all along the 38th parallel and that's that was basically the start of the war following north korea's full-scale invasion into the south a radio broadcast coming from pyongyang had claimed that south korea had rejected the north's proposal for peaceful unification by leading military skirmishes into their territory and attacking several towns and villages inside the haiju region right above the 38th parallel and by extension provoking a northern counteroffensive. these attacks which were carried out on haiju are said to have occurred early in the morning the day of the invasion General Chung Sung Chul of the Korean People's Army recalls his personal account. Quite honestly, at the time, I thought it was another of the enemy's large-scale provocations. As yet, I did not know it was going to be all-out war. While I was thinking it was just another armed incursion, there came the order from our superiors to counterattack. Only then did I realize that the enemy had started the war throughout Korea. And in an article published by China Quarterly titled, How the Korean War Began, a great deal of corroborating evidence is presented, vindicating the North side of the story. Few have cared to note that on the very day of the start of the war, the two most strategically important towns in Korea adjacent to the 38th parallel, namely Kaesong in the south and Haiju in the north, respectively were reported to have been captured by the opposing hostile forces. While the UN Commission on Korea heard the North Korean broadcast on June 25, 1950 alleging the South Korean attack on Haiju, it simply brushed aside that complaint without an inquiry and accepted South Korea's complaint of an unprovoked aggression to be true. Meanwhile, on the morning of the 25th, North Korea, in a statement which received much less attention, charged that the South had crossed the border, attacking the key town of Weju. This attack was denied by the South. And yet, by a curious coincidence, Seoul claimed later in the day that it had launched a successful counterattack in one area and one area alone, namely the Haiju region. The South Korean story of a counterattack in the Haiju region is substantiated in a large number of Western reports. The New York Times on the following day carried a story with this dateline reporting that, according to the South Korean Office of Public Information, southern troops pushing northwards had captured Haiju. The British Daily Herald quoted American military observers in Seoul as saying that the South Korean forces had penetrated five miles into the north and seized Haiju. Lieutenant Colonel Malinois was reported to have summed up the situation in the following terms. 
By nightfall, the 25th of June, all southern territory west of the Imjin River had been lost to a depth at least three miles inside the border except in the area of the Haiju counterattack. Similar reports were carried in the New York Herald Tribune, the Manchester Guardian, and many other British and American newspapers. And so South Korea claims that no such attack was ever carried out on Haiju before turning around and admitting that they did attack Haiju, but that they were the ones who were launching a counteroffensive in response to northern aggression. Claiming that they carried out this counteroffensive from the Ongjin Peninsula late in the evening on the 25th after the North had commenced their full scale invasion. But wait, something doesn't quite add up here. The North claims that their invasion was a counteroffensive in response to the South's invasion of Haiju early in the morning that same day. How can this be the case if the invasion of Haiju was a response to the North's invasion? Who are we to believe? The North? The South? Well, I have yet more quotations from Gupta's article that may help us reasonably deduct who exactly is at fault. The North Koreans attacked the Ongjin Peninsula at 4 a.m. on the 25th of June. The peninsula was never considered defensible in case of attack, and before the day ended, plans previously made were executed to evacuate the ROK 17th Regiment. Under the circumstances, how can we explain the official broadcasts from Seoul on the 26th of June at 9 a.m. to the effect that South Korean forces in the Ongjin area entered Haiju? The hypothesis cannot be excluded that the South Korean onslaught on Haiju from the Ongjin area took place sometime before 4 a.m. on the 25th of June, and that there must have been an element of surprise in this attack. The different contingents of the 1st Infantry Division of the ROK Army were mainly posted in the general area of the town of Kaesong. According to the various official and unofficial reports, this strategic South Korean town fell into the hands of the North Korean Army between 9 and 9.30 on the 25th of June, about five hours after its invasion. So, the capture of the strategic northern town of Haiju by the South Korean 1st ROK Division contingent deployed north of Kaesung appears inconceivable, INCONCEIVABLE, as a counterattack organized by South Korean forces. In short, we may reasonably surmise that if Haiju was captured, this military offensive could only have occurred coincidentally with or earlier than the North Korean offensive against the Ongjin Peninsula. Kronikar Gupta, How Did the Korean War Begin? And so, in conclusion, there is virtually no point chronologically that the South Korean army could have launched their counteroffensive on the Haiju region after the North's full-scale invasion into the South. On the contrary, all present evidence seems to suggest that South Korea's counteroffensive actually happened before the North's full-scale assault on the 25th of June, just as the radio broadcast originating from Pyongyang seems to suggest. Looks like the Reds were the ones telling the truth, after all. Let's talk about the significance of Haiju as a strategic target. Why would the South single out and attack Haiju? One possible reason could be because Haiju is a large manufacturing center that produced a number of essential heavy industry goods for the North, such as gold, iron, electricity, cement, and various industrial chemicals as well. And though this is true, this is not the only possible motivation behind the attack. Remember when I mentioned earlier how Syngman Rhee repeatedly bragged that he could defeat the North and take Pyongyang inside three days' time? Well, located inside the Haiju region just so happens to be the only functioning railway junction above the 38th parallel that leads directly to Pyongyang. And so, for the South to capture the Haiju region would also mean that the South would have a straight shot to quickly lay siege to the capital of North Korea. And this is probably what Syngman Rhee had in mind with all things considered. Within this context, the North's full-scale invasion into the South could be seen as an escalation of an ongoing conflict rather than an unprovoked act of aggression. Even if it is true that the North were the ones who started the war, they would be completely within their right to do so considering the fact that they are the legitimate governments of the land and it is the United States that are the ones illegally occupying and intruding on the territory of another sovereign nation. Chapter 11 The People's Army Sweeps the South in a Matter of Three Days The reason why many Western observers at the time were under the impression that it was the North who were the ones who started the war had to do with the rapidity with which they moved throughout the country. As within three days' time, the Korean People's Army had swept across the entirety of the South, capturing Seoul and driving the forces of the ROK all the way back to the southernmost edges of the country. How was it that the Korean People's Army was able to sweep across the South in record time like this? 
There are four main reasons as to why this is. The first reason had to do with the capture of logistical supply depots near the 38th parallel by northern forces at the onset of the invasion. These supplies, which were conveniently located right below the 38th parallel, would have been incredibly useful in the instance that the South had launched a full-scale invasion into the North. The second reason had to do with the existence of sleeper cell guerrilla units that operated underground across the country until becoming active and joining the KPA in their offensive. The third reason why they were able to do it so quickly had to do with the widespread sympathies and popular support for the North amongst the general Korean population. As with the arrival of the KPA, Kim Il-sung immediately called for the reconstitution of the People's Committees that were forcibly liquidated under General Hodge, along with the redistribution of the land, which had up to that point been made the property of South Korean landlords with the blessing of Syngman Rhee, and thus, with the help of the Korean People's Army, and under the guidance of Pak Han Young and the remnants of the original PRK in the South that were now out of hiding, the masses of farmers proceeded to carry out land reform, and the Korean working class began to resurrect the People's Committees that were disbanded just a few years prior. The fourth reason why the KPA was able to rapidly sweep the South in record time had to do with the terminally low morale of the ROK's army as large swaths and contingencies of South Korean troops ended up either fleeing and abandoning their posts or defecting to the north and joining the KPA. On the 2nd of July, 1950, an American observer from the New York Times reported that a high percentage of the South Korean army had straight up deserted their posts. Quote, some of them were wounded, some killed, but most of them just plain deserters, unquote. About a month later, MacArthur's headquarters disclosed to journalists that, quote, only six full divisions had been fully ready for combat when the invasion started, although the North Korean war plans called for 13 to 15." Unquote. And thus, the Republic of Korea's counteroffensive had all but collapsed as the KPA swept across the countryside. Northern sympathies were at a fever-high pitch, with broad popular support welcoming their arrival, guerrilla cells beginning to go active left and right, and large swaths of the Southern Army either disbanding their posts or defecting to the north. By this point, the situation was looking pretty dire for Syngman Rhee, and so in response to the rapid march of the Korean People's Army, be it to prevent northern forces from being bolstered even further, or just because reactionaries have a history of being spiteful and vindictive sore losers, i.e. see Japan, Rhee opted to have all of the suspected northern sympathizers and communists filling up South Korean prisons to be rounded up and executed. As the Korean People's Army made its advance, South Korean prisons, along with the Bodo Lee concentration camps, were emptied out, with thousands of prisoners being marched into trenches and shot with rifles. Regardless, no amount of last-minute executions was going to save Syngman Rhee from his impending removal from power, since only after a couple of days, the South's counteroffensive had utterly collapsed, and the forces of the KPA, with overwhelming amounts of popular support from the Korean people, were on the brink of winning the war and driving out the mongrel Japanese dogs and round-eyed Western devils for good. Chapter 12 The United States' Illegal Entry into the Korean War As soon as the war broke out, the United States quickly maneuvered to convene with the UN Security Council, framing the Civil War as an international conflict that warranted America's involvement on behalf of the South against alleged Northern aggression. Referring to a report from the UN Commission in Korea, as well as a telegram sent by the American ambassador in Seoul six hours before the fighting began as evidence that the North Koreans were the ones who started the war. Well, as it turns out, the documentation provided by the United States contains no evidence whatsoever that the North were the ones who started the war, only that both sides had accused one another of starting the war, nor did they contain any sort of evidence that there was any pre-existing international involvement from Russia or China. Remember, it was the Russians and the Chinese who were the ones who left Korea after the war, not the United States. Unfortunately, the United Nations never actually looked into the documentation provided by the U.S., nor was there any investigation into the validity of their claims, let alone any eyewitness accounts from UN observers of what actually happened. Instead, they simply took the South Korean authorities at their word and assumed that all of the allegations being made about Northern aggression were true. And thus, 
On the 27th of June, the UN Security Council voted to legally sanction the United States' involvement into this conflict, despite the fact that in doing so, the Security Council had violated the UN Charter in multiple ways. For one, this decision was made in the absence of two permanent seats of the Council, i.e. China and the USSR. And the UN is not allowed to carry out unilateral decisions such as this one without the involvement of all of its member nations. The Soviet Union had boycotted the Security Council for its refusal to recognize the People's Republic of China as the legitimate holder of China's seat at the Council, since at the time, China was still being represented by the Kuomintang-led Republic of China out of Taiwan. Furthermore, it is also strictly prohibited in the Charter of the United Nations for members of the Council to involve themselves in the internal affairs of another sovereign nation, since all the way up until America invaded, the Korean War was effectively a civil war with no involvement from the outside world. On top of all of that, according to UN international law, self-determination is a sovereign right of all people everywhere, and so the Korean people were completely within their right to expel the Syngman Rhee dictatorship and to install a government and leadership that actually represented them and their interests. Despite all of this, the UN Council proceeded to hold its own charter in contempt, ignoring its own rules and guidelines, and providing the United States with its stamp of approval to go to war granting America the veneer of perceived international legitimacy that it needed in order to conduct a full-scale invasion of Korea. Chapter 13 The Korean War, Chinese Intervention, and MacArthur's Dream The Korean War had developed over the course of multiple phases. During the first phase of the war, which took place over late summer of 1950 between June and September, the KPA were on the brink of ousting Syngman Rhee and liberating all of Korea. As they had successfully captured Seoul and had driven the ROK forces back to the furthest southernmost edges of the country. Even after the arrival of American troops in July and in August, the KPA had successfully held the line and gave the imperialists no room to advance. The second phase of the war officially began on the 15th of September, when General MacArthur and his amphibious forces arrived at Incheon, halfway up the peninsula, and on the 25th of September, succeeded in recapturing Seoul. This had the effect of, on one hand, limiting the arrival of the DPRK's reinforcements, while on the other hand, cutting off the ability of KPA troops located in the south to quickly retreat back to the north. Instead, KPA forces south of Seoul would be forced to take the long path around the city and through the wilderness in order to get back home. From there, the United Nations ordered that the DPRK halts its assault and retreats back to the 38th parallel, a demand to which the North immediately acquiesced. It is here that the conflict could have, and really should have, come to an end. Since the United States had succeeded in restoring the status quo as it wanted, taking back and fortifying its hold on the south, and sending northern troops on their way out the door. Little did the North Koreans know, however, that U.S. General Douglas MacArthur, with the approval of President Truman, had far more sinister plans in mind. For the imperialists, it wasn't enough to have their puppet regime back in power. The time had now come for them to liberate North Korea. On the 30th of September, 1950, the U.S. military made its advance into the north, crossing the 38th parallel, launching an assault on the DPRK, and successfully capturing Pyongyang. About a month later, China made its entry into the war since MacArthur's forces had encroached themselves along the Yalu River, technically crossing into Chinese territory. Chairman Mao Zedong sent a volunteer army of 300,000 troops into Korea to aid the KPA in their fight against the U.S. Between the months of November and December in the year 1950, the joint forces of the Korean People's Army and the People's Liberation Army had succeeded in breaking the U.S. and ROK's offensive, virtually destroying South Korea's invading army, capturing and liberating Pyongyang, and eventually repelling U.S. forces behind the 38th parallel once more. The status quo had yet again been restored, and the conflict could have, and really should have, come to an end right then and there. Unfortunately, shit's about to get really dark. Naturally, General MacArthur wasn't too happy about his far more advanced and well-equipped army decisively getting their asses handed to them by a bunch of ragtag Koreans and Chinese peasants armed with Kalashnikovs. And so MacArthur had a dream. A dream that President Truman gave him the legal authorization to wipe the North Koreans out in a genocidal nuclear holocaust. 
from there on out, it became MacArthur's highest ambition to render every square mile of territory above the 38th parallel an uninhabitable nuclear wasteland. Quote, Of all of the campaigns of my life, 20 major ones to be exact, Korea was the one I felt the most sure of was the one I was deprived of waging. I could have won the war in Korea in a maximum of 10 days. I would have dropped between 30 and 50 atomic bombs on his air bases and other depots strung across the neck of Manchuria. It was my plan as our amphibious forces moved south to spread behind us, from the Sea of Japan to the Yellow Sea, a belt of radioactive cobalt. It could have been spread from the wagons, carts, trucks, and planes. For at least 60 years, there could have been no land invasion of Korea from the north. The enemy could not have marched across that irradiated belt. U.S. Army General Douglas MacArthur, Retrospective on the Korean War on the 25th of January, 1954. President Truman shared this dream, though only in part, for his version didn't involve the use of nukes. Opting to instead authorize the use of as many conventional non-nuclear weapons and explosives as needed in order to completely decimate Korea. And so in 1951, the third phase of the war began. Although MacArthur wasn't given everything that he wanted, it was under his campaign that the U.S. military went out of its way to strafe as many crowds of unarmed innocent civilians with machine gun fire and carpet bomb as many buildings and structures as needed in order to break the collective bodies and spirit of the Korean people. Quote, Last week, South Korean President Kim Dae-jung urged the U.S. to conduct a thorough inquiry into the alleged mass killing of Korean civilian refugees by U.S. soldiers. He told the U.S. Army Secretary, Luis Caldera, who was visiting Seoul, that the, quote, truth should be clearly brought out so that South Korea-U.S. relations should not be damaged and will instead be enhanced, unquote. Mr. Caldera's visit to South Korea follows a recent investigation by the Associated Press news agency into a number of horrifying incidents. Its reports have shattered the conventional picture that all of the atrocities in the Korean War were committed by North Koreans or their Chinese allies. U.S. veterans interviewed by AP said that they machine-gunned hundreds of helpless civilians under a railway bridge at Nogunri on July 26, 1950. A week later, according to other veterans, a U.S. general ordered the destruction of two strategic bridges across the Natsukong River killing hundreds of civilians. Quote, it was a tough decision, unquote, wrote Hopper Gray, the 1st Cavalry Division commander, in a now declassified document. The AP investigation documents other incidents in 1950 to 1951 when U.S. jets repeatedly attacked groups of Koreans in civilian clothes on the suspicion that they harbored enemy infiltrators. In one strike, U.S. firebombs are said to have killed 300 civilians trapped in a cave. Some pilots expressed the concern that they were machine-gunning innocent people. Korean commenters say that the incidents have been long well known, but while South Korea was under the military dictatorship, the victims and their family members had to keep silent, fearing punishment if they spoke out." Unquote. And these are only a handful of examples that are just now coming to light. According to leaked information from Seoul's very own Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there are hundreds of documentable instances of civilian massacres that were carried out by the U.S. military and Allied Air Forces at this time, strafing defenseless crowds of fleeing civilians and refugees with machine gun fire. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission estimates an incredibly lowball conservative minimum of 100,000 unarmed victims who died this way. When the United States launched its second offensive into the North, they flattened everything and anything in sight via widespread carpet bombing. General MacArthur called upon the use of incendiaries to burn every city, village, and factory north of the 38th parallel to the ground. Over the next couple of years of the Korean War, the United States Air Force dropped over 600,000 tons of bombs and over 32,000 tons of napalm on North Korea. In comparison, about 500,000 tons of bombs were dropped across the entirety of the Pacific Ocean during World War II. In a first-hand account from journalist Joanne Robinson, she stated that, quote, there was not one stone standing upon another in Pyongyang. According to the DPRK themselves, the United States destroyed close to 9,000 factories, 5,000 schools, 1,000 hospitals, and some 600,000 homes over the course of its carpet bombing campaign. Dean Rusk, the Assistant Secretary of the State for Far East Affairs at the time stated, quote, everything that moved in North Korea, every brick standing on top of another, we bombed, unquote. 
1952, U.S. forces targeted irrigation dams along the Yalu River, destroying several reservoirs and flooding thousands of acres of farmland and rural housing, effectively cutting off the North's domestic food supply as well. By the end of the Korean War, virtually every city and settlement above the 38th parallel had been reduced to rubble, and the estimated number of fatalities that the Korean people suffered at the hands of America's genocidal campaign ranged from 2.3 to 3 million, or roughly 20% of North Korea's population. Chinese casualties are estimated to be about 500,000 to about a million, while U.S. casualties were comparably low at about 36,000. And while these bombings and terror attacks were being conducted in the North, a silenced campaign of anti-nationalist, anti-communist repression and mass murder was being undertaken and carried out by South Korea's secret police. Chapter 14 The Bodo League Massacre, Fascist Terror in South Korea Due to the sheer volume of popular anti-colonial pro-Northern sentiments across the South, as well as the general contempt for the Reed dictatorship and occupying forces resonating amongst the general masses, the US-backed fascist government, unable to discern who was or wasn't an insurgent, decided to opt for a policy of scorched earth. And so in order to beat the general South Korean population into submission, they killed everybody and anybody who was a suspected Northern collaborator or sympathizer. It didn't matter whether or not they actually were, only that the South Korean government thought that they were. These mass arrests and killings were carried out by the Korean National Police, or the KNP for short. The KNP can be best thought of as the South Korean equivalent of the German SS, as it was a secret police force which was heavily staffed with Japanese officers from the colonial era and was tasked with ridding the South of any and all communists, insurgents, and northern collaborators. Over the course of the Reed Dictatorship, hundreds of thousands of suspected communists, nationalists, and northern sympathizers were systematically rounded up and arrested by the KNP. Many of them were executed. However, most were simply taken and jailed in South Korean concentration camps and enrolled in the Bodo League system. In the years leading up to the war, the Reed Dictatorship had already executed and imprisoned tens of thousands of Korean patriots and northern sympathizers who had an active part to play in one of the numerous uprisings that took place in direct opposition to the ROK. As discussed earlier, during the initial first phase of the war when the North made their advance, the South Korean Dictatorship went out of their way to execute all of its political prisoners before the KPA could arrive and liberate them. And then, over the course of the Korean War, Syngman Rhee imposed a fascistic terror campaign over the general population, in which hundreds of thousands of suspected Korean nationalists and communists were arrested by the secret police, killed, and then dumped into mass graves. According to Korean historian Hun Jun Kim, at least 300,000 people were detained and executed or simply disappeared by the South Korean government in the first few months after the conventional war began." Unquote. In the decades following these massacres and repressions, the South Korean government did a fine job making sure any and all surviving victims kept their mouths shut about it, as well as erasing their crimes from the history books. Just now, decades later, this information is finally coming to light, along with the true extent of the United States' barbaric terrorism in the North. Keep in mind that this campaign of mass murder was directly backed and enabled by the United States. For the Republic of Korea would not have had the weapons or material support that they needed in order to conduct this anti-communist genocide without active help from America. Chapter 15 The fighting ends, the U.S. retreats to the 38th parallel, and the long ceasefire begins. Despite the U.S. military's best efforts to actually kill every living, breathing organism north of the 38th parallel, the Koreans and Chinese fought on. In the wake of the widespread destruction of their homes and cities, the DPRK was quick to erect bomb shelters and subterranean infrastructure to compensate, constructing underground factories, hospitals, schools, and even housing in order to ensure the continued survival of the Korean people. So after virtually everything on the surface had been destroyed, there was still an underground infrastructural basis for the Koreans to continue their resistance. As the U.S. military encroached further and further towards the northern boundary towards Manchuria, the Chinese took an increasingly prevalent role in the war. After a certain point, the U.S. military found themselves fighting significantly more Chinese than they did Koreans. MacArthur didn't care, however, for he actually wanted to continue the Korean War directly into mainland China. 
MacArthur's rationale was that if we don't stop the Reds here and now, that they would become too much of a threat to handle later. And so President Truman, realizing that MacArthur's plans would potentially instigate a Third World War, would rebuff the general and eventually fire him when it became clear that his Asiatic bloodthirst was too much of a liability for even Congress's liking. And when those guys of all people think that you're a little too obsessed with killing Asians, well, you know you've gone too far. To quote an article from the Constitutional Rights Foundation summarizing the events, quote, On November 25th, 1950, Nearly 200,000 Chinese soldiers poured across the Yalu River, forcing UN forces into full retreat to the south. MacArthur demanded authority to bomb Chinese bases north of the Yalu in China itself, but fearing a widening of the war and possible entry of the Soviet Union, Truman and his advisors refused. Instead, they ordered him to organize a phased and orderly retreat. MacArthur was infuriated, so he proposed his own plan for victory. He wanted a complete blockade of the communist Chinese coastline. He wanted to bomb industrial sites and other strategic targets within China. He wanted to bring nationalist Chinese troops from Formosa to fight in Korea. Finally, he wanted the nationalists to invade weak positions on the communist Chinese mainland. Appalled that MacArthur's plan could launch World War III, Truman and the top military leaders in Washington quickly rejected it. But MacArthur continued to publicly argue for his plan. He also criticized the politicians in Washington for refusing to allow him to bomb Chinese bases north of the Yalu River. He did all of this in spite of an order from his superiors in Washington to not make any public statements on foreign or military policy without first getting approval from the Department of State or Defense. A few days after MacArthur received notice from Truman's peace proposal, again without getting any clearance from Washington, MacArthur taunted the Chinese for failing to conquer South Korea. He then went on to threaten to attack China unless the Chinese gave up the fight. He even said he would meet the enemy military commander to arrange how to end the war. Truman met for several days with his top advisors. In the end, they all agreed that MacArthur had to go because, quote, the military must be controlled by civilian authority in the country, unquote. And thus, on the order of President Truman for a ceasefire, along with the unrelenting concerted efforts of the Koreans and the Chinese army, who, mind you, were never going to give up, the forces of reaction retreated back behind the 38th parallel, and the fighting came to a stop, and the 70-year-long ceasefire that goes on to this day officially began. In the wake of the Korean War, and all of the bloodshed that followed suit, the blame falls chiefly and primarily on the United States of America, for it was the United States who made war inevitable by drawing an arbitrary line in the sand and partitioning the country into two. It was the United States who outlawed the original indigenous governments in the South and imposed a fascist dictatorship in its place, and gave Syngman Rhee the power and resources he needed in order to terrorize and oppress the general population. It was the United States who lied its way into the war. It was the United States who continues to this day to lie about a number of key facts and events pertaining to the war. The United States, who spent two straight years carpet-bombing civilian infrastructure and machine-gunning crowds of unarmed civilians, killing millions in the process. And it was the United States that to this very day imposes ruthless sanctions on the North and routinely threatens to reinvade it and finish the genocide that it started 70 years ago. Chapter 16 The four-way split in the Workers' Party of Korea and political purges under Kim Il-sung Within the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea existed four prominent factions whom contested one another for power during and after the Korean War. The first were the South Korean Communists led by Pak Han Young. The second were the Yanin faction whom were comprised of Chinese partisans led by Pak Chang Ok. The third were the Soviet Korean faction comprised of Soviet partisans led by Alexei Hegai. And then the fourth and final were the domestic Communists led by Kim Il Sung and his guerrilla forces. In the year 1950, Kim Il-sung instigated a series of purges with the intent of rooting out corruption, defeatism, mutiny, and incompetence within the ranks of the army and the political machinery. Over half a million members of the Workers' Party of Korea were disciplined for their passivity and inactivity during the war, with key political figures and military personnel such as Mu Jong, Kim Chayek, and Lim Chun-chu being purged for their, quote, 
failure to maintain discipline in the ranks of the party and the army, as well as, quote, failure to coordinate an organized retreat, unquote, in the face of advancing Allied forces. A number of other generals and officers within the KPA were also removed from their posts after being blamed for various military blunders and failure to sustain morale. These purges, however, were taken a bit too far for Kim's liking, and so in November of 1951, a year after the first wave of purges, the 4th Central Committee plenum deflected blame for excesses during the purge on, quote, leftist deviations, and readmitted 30% of the party members who were previously expelled. Sometime between late 1952 and 1953, it had come to Kim's attention that several members of the South Korean Workers' Party were plotting a coup d'etat against him at the upcoming Central Committee plenum. Pak An Young was to be the new premier, Chu Yong Ha and Chang Si Hu were to be the vice premiers, and a dozen other individuals were to be the leaders of the various ministries governing the country. The conspirators had plans to utilize the military to forcibly remove Kim and his administration at gunpoint, with troops to be stationed outside of Pyongyang on standby the day of the coup. Kim Il-sung, now aware of this plot, quickly outmaneuvered the conspirators by first orchestrating a one-month delay of the upcoming plenum to buy time, and then going out of his way to secure the allegiances of as many members of the Central Committee and the military as he possibly could behind the scenes. During the plenum itself, the South Korean Workers' Party members collectively attacked Kim Il-sung and attempted to turn the Central Committee against him, accusing him of consolidating power, fomenting a personality cult, breaching democratic centralism, and ignoring the widespread hunger and poverty in the countryside in favor of a policy of super-industrialization. Well, geez, I wonder where we have heard all of this before. The South Korean Workers' Party members called for the removal of Kim from power and lobbied their case to the best of their ability. But in the end, the Central Committee stood in allegiance with Kim, and word of their conspiracy had now come to light. Not long afterwards, the dozen or so conspirators were arrested and convicted of espionage, the indiscriminate destruction and slaughter of democratic forces in the South, and the attempted overthrow of the government. Although most of the allegations levied against the conspirators verged on absurdity, the charge of conspiracy to overthrow the government was absolutely legitimate, and that alone should have been sufficient to put them away for treason. But for whatever reason, they felt the need to add a number of other trumped-up charges on the trial. During the trial itself, the defendants admitted guilty to all charges and confessed that they wanted to see Kim Il-sung replaced by Pak An Young. As for Pak An Young himself, though he was arrested and expelled from the party as well, he wouldn't be put on trial and charged until two years later in 1955, in which he was convicted of the same charges, including, quote, being a lackey of the Americans, unquote. Though the attempted coup d'etat carried out by the South Korean partisans had failed, this did not mean that the pro-Soviet and Chinese factions within the Workers' Party of Korea didn't have plans of their own. In 1953, Nikita Khrushchev became the new leader of the Soviet Union. In February of 1956, during the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, he denounced Stalin in his infamous secret speech and initiated his policy of de-Stalinization. During the summer prior, Kim Il-sung was summoned to Moscow for several weeks to be instructed in the ways of Khrushchevite policies, and how he was basically expected by the Soviets to fall in line with the new orthodoxy. While Kim was away at this meeting, both leaders of the Soviet and Chinese partisans within the Workers' Party of Korea, Pak gang ok and Cho chang ik devised a plan to oust him in an event that would become known as the August Faction Incident. Kim was once again attacked for his autocratic style of rule, not utilizing the correct methods of leadership, developing a personality cult, and the participants were actively calling for his removal. As was the case with the failed coup of 1953, Kim's popular support within the assembly was too great, and when plans of this coup d'etat being orchestrated by the Soviet and Chinese partisans came to light, both factions were expelled from the party and their associated leadership were then arrested and shot. By 1958, the Yanin, Soviet, and South Korean factions had all been completely eliminated, and by 1959, an emergency election needed to be held in order to fill the huge chunk of now vacant seats in the Supreme People's Assembly. By the early 1960s, the purges had finally come to an end. President and Secretary General Kim Il-sung and his original guerrilla forces, who stood by his side since the days that they were exiles in Manchuria fighting the Japanese, were now the sole, undisputed leadership of North Korea.
In the end, Kim Il-sung had succeeded in decisively defeating the Japanese colonial occupiers, liberating the northern half of Korea, very nearly succeeding in liberating the southern half as well. He successfully sustained his hold on North Korea in the face of America's carpet bombing campaign, saw to it that a thriving socialist economy was constructed and that the needs of his people were met. He decisively defeated his rivals in the political arena. Throughout the course of the Cold War, he played both sides of the Sino-Soviet split to the benefit of his own country. He inspired and gave material aid to Third World revolutionaries and anti-colonial resistance movements internationally. And he established a government and society that was capable of surviving not only his own death, but at the same time, universal condemnation from the international community, the harshest sanctions in the history of sanctions, and the impending threat of continued genocide at the hands of the United States. If there has ever been Chapter 17 The Student Revolution, the ousting of Sigmund Rhee, the military junta of Park Chung-hee, and the five republics of Korea that followed. Despite the complete virtual destruction of the original Korean independence movement in the South at the hands of the U.S. and the ROK, the South Korean proletariat fought on, as the seeds of a new movement took root even after the systematic mass killings of many of its original participants. This neonate resistance movement would amalgamate into the Student Revolution of 1960. The Student Revolution, also known as the April Revolution, was a peaceful pro-democracy movement which initially erupted in the town of Masan in direct opposition to Syngman Rhee's autocratic government. The catalyst for these uprisings began two months prior in the city of Taegu, with educational authorities blocking students from being able to participate in local elections. In addition, in a newspaper article published by the Dong A. Li Bo on the 28th of February, it was revealed that the government had plans to illegally rig elections, a practice which had been ongoing in the ROK for over a decade up to that point. As on the day of the election, Syngman Rhee's chosen successor by the name of Li K. Poong won the vice presidential seat in what is recognized today as a transparently fraudulent election. And on the day of the presidential election on March 15th, a massive rally was hosted by an alliance of students and workers demanding the resignation of Syngman Rhee and the establishment of a new government by the name of the Second Republic of Korea. During this protest, the police killed a 17-year-old boy by the name of Kim Ju Liol, who was a participant and a local high school attendee. When word of this young boy's death caught wind across the Jeonseng province on the 11th of April, the students' revolution had officially begun. Days later, demonstrations and rallies were organized that swept across the country, with college students, professors, and labor organizers alike taking to the streets. On the 19th of April, a day referred to as Bloody Tuesday, over 100,000 students and protesters gathered outside of the Capitol building, demanding Syngman Rhee's resignation. In direct response to the action, Syngman gave the order to the police to open fire on the crowds with live ammunition, killing nearly 200 participants and injuring 6,000 more. Fortunately, the protesters' sacrifice was not in vain, as on the 26th of April, the movement accomplished its goal. Syngman Rhee was forced to resign, spending the remainder of his days in exile out in Hawaii. The First Republic of Korea was replaced by the Second Republic of Korea, a newly formed bourgeois democratic government. This new government proceeded to convict and sentence dozens of high-ranking members of the previous regime on a number of charges including, but not limited to, corruption, maladministration, electoral rigging, and so on. Tragically, this new government's rule was short-lived, as General Park Chun-hee orchestrated a martial coup against the Second Republic of Korea, ousting the new democratic government and replacing it with the Third Republic of Korea the following year in May of 1961. Establishing a military junta that was just as ruthless and repressive as the Syngman dictatorship before him. In 1972, Park Chun-hee's rule over the South was codified and legitimized under a new constitution, and the Fourth Republic of Korea was declared. Though the Fourth Republic of Korea was technically a new government, it was ruled and controlled by the exact same people as the Third. In 1979, Park Chun-hee was assassinated, 
and the Fourth Republic of Korea entered a period of political instability in which emergency elections were hosted the following year. And in 1981, the Fifth Republic of Korea was declared under the leadership of Chun Doo Hwan, whom was a military colleague and close friend of Park Chun Hee. And so in practice, the Fifth Republic of Korea was, you guessed it, yet another military dictatorship. The administration of this Fifth Republic was ultimately short-lived, as the Fifth Republic faced growing popular resistance from the South Korean population, which eventually amalgamated into a revolutionary movement calling for its dissolution and the democratization of South Korean politics. In 1987, the Korean people succeeded in bringing an end to the long line of military dictatorships and establishing bourgeois democracy. Since then, the region of Korea located below the 38th parallel has been governed by the 6th Korean Republic. For brevity's sake, I shan't chronicle all of these historical events in detail. So for now, I hope this was an adequate summary of some of these political developments in the Republic of Korea during the Cold War. Chapter 18 the economic trajectory of both Koreas. South Korea is arguably one of the most subsidized nations in history, receiving more economic support from the United States and the UN than the entirety of the continents of Africa combined over the course of the Cold War. Between 1953 and 1960, the ROK received an estimated $1.7 billion worth of economic assistance from the United States and the UN. From 1946 to 1976, the United States provided an additional $12.6 billion worth of economic aid on top of that, a subsidy amounting to double what Africa had received from the West during the same period. To this day, South Korea continues to be subsidized by the Western powers, with the total estimated foreign assistance given to the ROK amounting to a total of $35 billion according to a figure taken from the Borgen Project. And despite having tens of billions of dollars worth of loans, grants, and investment dumped into the ROK, the immediate result was no economic miracle. On the contrary, the ROK's economic performance floundered behind the DPRK consistently for the longest time, only beginning to catch up by the late 1980s and then finally overtaking it in the 1990s after the cessation of essential fertilizer imports from the now defunct USSR, along with the subsequent collapse of socialist trade networks critical to the continued growth of the DPRK's economy. Otherwise, as we can see from the graph on screen, when the estimated gross national product and income per capita of both countries are compared, we can clearly see that the DPRK outperformed the ROK for a very long time. Even when the economy of the ROK did start to overtake the DPRK, the wealth being generated had overwhelmingly gone to the top, with South Korea's Gini coefficients directly increasing in correlation to its gross national product. And for the longest time, South Korea's growth did not translate to elevated living standards for the general population as women and farm workers alike were notoriously known for having to work excessively long hours for comparably low wages, and unemployment benefits such as paid time off being virtually non-existent, on top of sky-high inflation, substandard housing, poor working conditions, weak labor laws, high levels of pollution, and a slew of other externalities symptomatic to the capitalist mode of production. Meanwhile, the North had all but guaranteed its workers a 40-hour work week, paid time off, equal gender pay, electoral democracy, workers' control of the means of production, a right to a job, health care, an education, a house, and a slew of other entitlements that were virtually non-existent in the South, and many of which are still non-existent to this day. Chapter 19 Korean Foreign Policy During the Cold War and Ties to the Black Panthers While the DPRK was never beholden to Moscow or Peking, as evidenced by the aforementioned purging of all Russian and Chinese partisans from the Workers' Party of Korea throughout the 1950s, they did rely on trade and aid from the socialist world to a significant degree. More specifically, fertilizer imports from Russia, as well as industrial and energy exports to East Germany. Out of the entire socialist world, East Germany in particular was a very close ally and trading partner of the DPRK as Kim Il-sung and Eric Honecker were good friends with one another who convened in private on a regular basis. Over the course of the Sino-Soviet split and the rising tensions that followed suit, the DPRK did its best to avoid picking sides and remaining neutral, as they were reliant on both the USSR for economic support, as well as China for military support. When the DPRK started to lean more in the direction of China during the Sino-Soviet split, 
with Kim Il-sung endorsing Mao Zedong's anti-revisionist criticisms of Khrushchev's Soviet Union, the USSR threatens to withdraw its subsidies to the country, and so throughout the Sino-Soviet rivalry, the DPRK partook in a great balancing act between the two, playing both sides against one another and making intelligent political maneuvers to secure its material interests at the international stage. After the May 16th coup in South Korea, in which Park Chun-hee seized power, the North had feared that under the new South Korean military dictatorship, that it was only a matter of time before the ceasefire came to an end and the hot war would resume once more. And so, in 1961, Kim Il-sung met with Premier Zhu Enlai in Beijing to sign the Sino-North Korean Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Mutual Assistance. This mutual aid pact was signed with the intent of promoting peaceful cooperation between both nations, in which both countries would exchange economic, technological, military, and cultural goods with one another. The DPRK has historically as well as contemporarily been treated as a political pariah, with only the socialist world recognizing its legitimacy after the Korean War. It wasn't until the 1970s when capitalist countries began recognizing the DPRK. Otherwise, throughout the Cold War, North Korea successfully forged a number of strong alliances with several socialist countries. Kim Il-sung shared close relationships with Yugoslav leader Josip Broz Tito, Romanian leader Nicolae Sesesu, East German leader Eric Honecker, as well as Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, routinely partaking in trade and mutual assistance with these countries. The DPRK also shared direct ties to a number of revolutionary nationalist groups such as the Black Panthers. Although the United States imposed a travel ban to the DPRK, Eldritch Cleaver along with a number of other prominent members of the Black Panther Party bypassed the restrictions and paid a number of visits to North Korea between the years 1969 and 1970. The Panthers lauded North Korea's success and considered it an economic miracle, with a thriving socialist economy that was outperforming the South by a wide margin. During his visit, Cleaver had this to say about the DPRK. Quote, Today, the DPRK is an earthly paradise, with an advanced socialist system, highly developed technology, a brilliant national culture, and a healthy people definitely on the move towards even greater achievements. Unquote. The Panthers recognized the DPRK as the legitimate government of Korea and regarded South Korea as a Yankee colony. Pantherism and Juche ideology share a number of parallels with one another. As a matter of fact, Pantherist ideology draws a great deal of inspiration from the Juche idea of self-reliance, perceiving African-American communities within the U.S. as an oppressed colonized population in a similar manner to the Koreans under Japanese rule. The Panthers claimed to be revolutionary diplomats who represented the colonized black population within the U.S. and throughout the Cold War, while American leaders presented themselves as champions of freedom and democracy, the Black Panthers and other radical groups of the like, with the backing and blessing of the DPRK, exposed their hypocrisy by casting light on their racism and exposing their active participation in the oppression of black and indigenous Americans. Chapter 20 the Collapse of Communism, the Death of Kim Il-sung, and the Korean War Today. In the year 1991, the Soviet Union was dissolved illegally and undemocratically under the first president of the Russian Federation, Boris Yeltsin, and not long after, the rest of the communist governments across Eastern Europe would follow suit. Capitalist dictatorships would seize power in a series of coup d'etats, as communist organizations and news outlets were banned. Untold thousands were either locked up and taken prisoner, or executed by the new capitalist regimes. Practically overnight, the collective economies of Eastern Europe immediately entered recession, as roughly a third of their gross national product ceased to exist. Billions of dollars worth of state property and publicly owned assets were auctioned off for a small percentage of their real cash value, and subsequently sucked out of these countries by foreign investors in an ongoing process known as capital flight. Hundreds of millions of people were immediately impoverished. Billions of rubles worth of savings in people's bank accounts vanished into thin air. Life expectancy fell by half a decade, as all-cause mortality rates spiked while fertility rates collapsed, resulting in the demographic crisis experienced across Eastern Europe today. Unemployment rose to nearly 15%. Real wages contracted while entitlements and benefits were stripped. Crime, violence, gang activity, the AIDS epidemic, 
drug abuse, alcoholism, mental illness, sex trafficking, and inequality proliferated and have now become permanent facts of life for most Eastern Europeans. And to this day, most of these countries' economies, demographic numbers, and quality of life outcomes have yet to fully recover. The reason why this is important to mention is because the USSR, along with the Eastern Bloc, constituted the primary trade network for the socialist world. Since the DPRK was subject to the Cold War embargo, along with the rest of the communist countries, North Korea by extension depended upon trade with the USSR and Warsaw Pact for their fertilizer imports and their industrial exports as well. The fertilizer imports in particular were especially crucial since the northern peninsula is incredibly mountainous and lacks the arable lands needed in order to produce all of its food domestically. And so when the USSR and Warsaw Pact were dissolved, they took this important alternative trade network with them. Without the USSR and Warsaw Pact to depend upon for trade, the DPRK's fertilizer imports and industrial exports were effectively cut off. And so during the 1990s, the North Korean economy entered recession. Natural disasters struck, destroying a great deal of what little agricultural infrastructure they had. And shortly thereafter, hunger swept the country. Let's talk about sanctions. Being the controller of the dollar, that is the world's primary reserve currency since the late 1940s, the United States possesses the unique ability to shunt any country that it wishes from participating in international trade. By the admission of the US government, the purpose of economic sanctions is to make living conditions under any given country so difficult and unbearable as to either a manufacture consent amongst its general population for regime change, and by extension generating the political will on the inside needed to foment a color revolution or a coup d'etat. Or b, to force the regime in question to liberalize, open up its markets to foreign penetration, and to otherwise acquiesce to the demands of the imperialists. In this way, Sanctions are a weapon of class warfare that are utilized as leverage against any protectionist democratic governments that seek to utilize its own domestic labor and resources to uplift and enrich its domestic working population, as opposed to enriching the transnational corporations and financial juggernauts of the world at the direct expense of keeping the third world proletariat in grinding poverty. The sanctions also serve as a useful propaganda tool against the socialist alternative to capitalism, since U.S. propagandists can point to the weakened economy of the DPRK and substandard living conditions as evidence that socialism doesn't work, deliberately leaving out the context that it is precisely because of these ruthless sanctions as to why the DPRK is facing as much economic hardship as it is in the first place. Sanctions as propaganda is, in every sense of the term, victim-blaming. It is blaming the victim for circumstances that are artificially imposed on them from the outside. And the North Koreans have suffered because the United States has done everything we possibly could to destroy the economy of North Korea. We've done everything we possibly could to boost the economy of South Korea. And then we condemn them because they are backward and, and because their people are starving. These sanctions were imposed on the North during a period of famine, brought on by the cessation of crucial fertilizer imports from the communist world, on top of the fact that they experienced a great deal of flooding and natural disaster at this time. To make matters worse, the aforementioned sanctions made it virtually impossible for the DPRK to adequately address this widespread hunger, as well since due to the imminent threat of invasion and nuclear Armageddon from the United States, without the USSR to protect it, the North Korean government had to spread its resources thin between meeting its civilian population's needs and maintaining a military strong enough to ward off a potential invasion from the United States. To top it all off, Kim Il-sung, Secretary General and the only president that North Korea has ever had, would pass away on the 8th of July, 1994. And with his death, he took the wisdom and guidance that the Korean people had depended upon for decades to lead them through these difficult times. After the death of Kim Il-sung, his position as president of the DPRK was abolished, and he was succeeded by his son Kim Jong-il as the new general secretary of the Workers' Party of Korea. In the year 1980, during the 6th Congress of the Workers' Party of Korea, in a move that was widely criticized by both the liberal and communist world alike, Kim Il-sung expressed the desire for his son to be the next leader of the country, and so he proceeded to set Kim Jong-il up to succeed him later on in life. Three months after his death, on the 8th of October 1994, Kim Jong-il was elected Secretary General of the Workers' Party of Korea. Amidst this new era of strife, 
between the famine and the collapse of socialist trade. On top of the sanctions and imminent threat of invasion by the United States, the very act of survival became tantamount to the regime. And so under the tenure of Kim Jong-il, the Songun policy was enacted and enforced. The Songun policy, aka Military First, was a principle that actually predated the new administration, finding its basis in the thought of Kim Il-sung, who believed that the nation's continued survival and prosperity was contingent on the existence of a strong and well-organized military. One could call it a highly militarized variation of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Well, during the 1990s, the DPRK was caught between a rock and a hard place. It lacked the ability to import trade and aid from the outside world. It lacked significant allies to defend it as even China was now recognizing and upholding US sanctions on North Korea. And it lacked the arable land or agricultural infrastructure to produce all of its food domestically. And so the DPRK was confronted by an ultimatum. They could A, abandon their military-industrial complex and instead turn around to devote what little domestic manpower and resources that they have to alleviating the widespread hunger and starvation, or they could B, prioritize their military above all else while focusing on what little disaster relief they could with whatever resources they had left over. In the end, they went with option B since the former would have all but guaranteed the destruction of the DPRK at the hands of the United States military. On the other hand, the South Korean government routinely preys upon the economic desperation imposed on the North by attempting to lure and entice its citizens into defecting to the South with economic incentives. One of these incentives involves providing large sums of money and media attention to any defectors who are willing to lie and tell outrageous tales about their lived experience in North Korea. The more ridiculous and outlandish the account, the more money and clout will be given to this person. This is where you get grifters such as Yeon Mi Park, whom coincidentally is also a fascist, being granted huge amounts of media attention and being chronically broadcasted across the airways despite the fact that she is a proven liar who has been exposed on numerous occasions. In our next episode, we'll be dealing with this fraud along with the information war being waged against North Korea in detail. But for now, all I can do is recommend the mini-documentary put together by the PSL titled Loyal Citizens of Pyongyang which will give you a glimpse into the true scope of this misinformation campaign. For now, let's move right along. In the aftermath of the 1990s famine that swept across North Korea, upwards of a million lives were claimed due to starvation thanks to the US-led economic warfare on the DPRK. Yeah, I'm putting the blame on the United States of America for that one. <laughs> Sushi, 전기선 잘라와라. 전기선 몇 킬로에 쌀 오면 저 바꿔준다. 이렇게 말을 했어요. 근데 미국이 석거리가 왜 필요하겠어요? 어, 우리가 가스가 안 들어오고 전기가 안 들어오고 하니까 그래도 농사는 지어서 이민들 먹여 살려야 되잖아. 그래서 밭을 갈아야 되는데 트랙터리 트랙터가 못 돌아가요. 기름이 없으니까. 그래서 소가 밭을 갈게 됐어요. 근데 소가 꼬리가 없으면 힘을 못 쓴대요. 그러니까 농사를 망치게 하려고 농사를 멋지게 하려고 일부러 소를 꺼리를 잘라라고 한 거예요. 북을 붕괴시키려고 다 굶은 거 죽여야 미국이 북에까지 넘어갈 수 있으니까. Chapter 21. A brief history of the DPRK nuclear weapons program. Between 1958 and 1991, the United States had secretly deployed nuclear warheads to the ROK. Pentagon planners and U.S. Army generals frequently ran war games where the DPRK could be defeated through the use of nukes should the Korean armistice come to an end. And they did this knowing that the DPRK couldn't respond in kind because they had not yet attained a nuclear arsenal of their own. At one point, they were quietly planning a bombing raid to destroy the Yongbyon nuclear facility in Pyongyang, which would have not only severely crippled the DPRK's power production, but also prevents them from getting the fuel that they need in order to make nuclear bombs. Ultimately, Washington chose not to carry out this attack, since to do so would have provoked a counterattack, which would have likely resulted in the complete destruction of Seoul, 
since the capital of the ROK is within shelling distance of the DPRK's long-range artillery. The very first attempt that was ever made by the DPRK to utilize nuclear warheads as a deterrent against US aggression was ironically enough when they joined the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in March of 1985. This treaty, for those of you who do not know, is a formal agreement between countries across the world to work towards the ultimate goal of global nuclear disarmament. The treaty obligates that the nuclear powers assist the non-nuclear powers in the enrichment of uranium for peaceful civilian purposes such as power production, as well as working to curtail the production of nuclear warheads internationally. The treaty preamble also obliges, quote, that in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations, states must refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state, unquote. Unfortunately, international law doesn't seem to apply to the Western powers, as the United States, France, and Britain are the most militaristic societies on Earth, which are perpetually involved in offensive wars of aggression and regime change. These very same powers are also the first ones to actively rebuff their obligations to the treaty, claiming that they have a specifically unique need for a nuclear arsenal in order to defend themselves. Furthermore, these countries also have no problem ignoring the Non-Proliferation Treaty's preamble, invoking the UN Charter which explicitly calls for governments to refrain from the use of offensive violence or aggression against another sovereign nation, given these countries' involvement in the invasion of Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the bombing of Yugoslavia, the bombing of Libya, etc. At the same time, the Western colonial powers will selectively invoke the treaty whenever it's convenient for them in order to denounce and demonize the DPRK for their production of nuclear missiles, as well as condemning them for being an aggressor nation despite the fact that North Korea hasn't started a single war since its inception. The DPRK's time in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was incredibly short-lived, as in 1993, U.S. Strategic Command announced that it was going to redirect its nuclear missiles away from the former Soviet Union and towards the DPRK. And so, in direct response to what is otherwise a very deliberate act of aggression, the DPRK decided to go tit-for-tat by withdrawing from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty one month later, since America is apparently just going to threaten them with nuclear death regardless of their status as a member of the NPT. Not long afterwards, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter flew out to Pyongyang on a diplomatic mission to meet with Kim Il-sung and to bargain with the Koreans to get them back into the NPT in exchange for normalizing relations with the U.S., allowing for the construction of two proliferation-safe water reactors in Pyongyang, and the easing up on some of the sanctions to allow fuel and oil imports to the DPRK while said power plants were under construction. The United States offered this deal with the intent of deliberately dragging their feet on their end of the bargain since by that point, Washington believed that the accumulative effects of the sanctions, along with Pyongyang's massive defense budget and inability to meet civilian sector needs would collapse the DPRK from the inside by the early 2000s. Ultimately, they were wrong. Despite their best efforts to destroy the DPRK through siege and economic warfare, the revolutionary governments of the North survived. When the 2000s rolled around and it became evident that the DPRK was here to stay, President George Bush proceeded to tear up the original agreement, declaring North Korea to be a part of the Axis of Evil and placing the DPRK on a list of countries deemed valid targets by Washington for an offensive nuclear strike. This list of countries included the likes of Russia, China, Syria, Libya, Iran, and Iraq. North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. In direct response to George W. Bush's violence bloodthirsty tirade, the DPRK decided to do what any sane and rational nation fighting for its own self-preservation would do in this situation by doubling down on its decision to leave the NPT and then proceeding to amass an arsenal of nuclear weapons. DPRK diplomat Yango Tai explains North Korea's decision to stay out of the NPT as such. Quote, 
The NPT clearly states that nuclear power states cannot use nuclear weapons for the purposes of threatening or endangering non-nuclear states. So the DPRK thought that if we joined the NPT, we would be able to get rid of the nuclear threat from the US. Therefore, we joined. However, the US never withdrew its right of preemptive nuclear strike. They always said that once US interests are threatened, they always have the right to use their nuclear weapons for preemptive purposes. The world situation changed again after September 2001. After this, Bush said that if the US wants to protect its safety, then it must remove the axis of evil countries from the earth. These countries he listed as members of this axis of evil were Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Having witnessed what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq, we came to realize that we couldn't put a stop to the threat from the US with conventional weapons alone. So we realized that we needed our own nuclear weapons in order to defend the DPRK and its people." Unquote. From here on out, the United States would carry forth its good cop, bad cop routine. With the Democrats on one hand periodically trying to offer more tenable diplomatic terms to the DPRK, while the Republicans were actively threatening to kill them all on the other. In 2003, America launched its full-scale invasion of Iraq titled Operation Desert Storm. The country of Iraq, lacking the nuclear arsenal or modernized air force needed to defend itself, was promptly destroyed and bombed back to the Stone Age. Around that same time, the war in Afghanistan commenced. Afghanistan, lacking the nuclear arsenal or modernized air force needed to defend itself, was promptly destroyed and bombed back to the Stone Age. In the aftermath, U.S. warmonger John Bolton warned Iran, Syria, and the DPRK to draw the appropriate lesson from the invasion, effectively threatening them to kowtow before the U.S. or face similar levels of destruction. Well, two years later, the DPRK's response was to successfully detonate its first nuclear warhead in 2005. By 2017, the DPRK carried out five additional successful nuclear warhead detonations and had now possessed for itself a small arsenal of long-range intercontinental ballistics missiles, or ICBMs for short. It was at long last that the DPRK had the nuclear deterrence that it needed in order to ward off the United States. In the year 2010, at the time President Barack Obama declared that the U.S. would no longer use or threaten to use nuclear warheads against nations which did not possess nuclear warheads of their own, striking a deal with the North Koreans that if they gave up their nuclear weapons in return to the NPT, that Washington would swear from here on out to never make use of nukes against them. Around that same time, America was also demanding that Libya gave up its Air Force and nuclear weapons program, and so Libya, in a naive yet good-faith effort to maintain positive diplomatic relations with the West, complied. Not long afterwards, the United States invaded, and then Libya, lacking the nuclear arsenal or modernized air force needed in order to defend itself, was promptly destroyed and bombed back to the Stone Age, while UN assassins murdered Gaddafi in a horrible manner so disgraceful and disgusting that I dare not describe it on video. In the wake of these invasions, the DPRK took the example set by their other Third World contemporaries to heart. Quote, What happened to Libya? When Gaddafi wanted to improve Libya's relations with the US and UK, the imperialists said that in order to attract international investment, he would have to give up his weapons program. Gaddafi even said that he would visit the DPRK to convince us to give up our nuclear program. But once Libya dismantled all of its nuclear programs, and this was confirmed by Western intelligence, the West changed its tune. The tragic consequences in those countries which abandoned halfway their nuclear programs, yielding to the high-handed practices and pressure of the U.S. in recent years, clearly prove that the DPRK was very far-sighted and just when it made the option. They also teach the truth that the U.S. nuclear blackmail should be countered with substantial countermeasures, not with compromise or retreat, unquote. KNCA, February 13th, 2013. Needless to say, as of 2022, the nukes aren't going away, as the DPRK has now passed a law making the production and accumulation of a nuclear arsenal a permanent state of affairs. That is to say, Getting rid of the nukes is no longer an option at the bargaining table. That ship has sailed. Which, given the history reviewed thus far, along with the constant threatening and repeated attempts by the United States to blackmail and backstab the DPRK, was a wise move on the part of the Supreme People's Assembly.
Conclusion Critical Support for the DPRK Amidst this long and detailed history, one thing is for certain, and that is that the United States of America will stop at nothing to destroy the DPRK. But why is this the case? Why is it that the capitalist powers are so hell-bent on destroying every socialist and even social democratic country that emerges in the second and third world? In order to understand why, one must first understand the true nature of the American Empire. For all of its flowery rhetoric pertaining to spreading freedom and democracy and advancing human rights is little more than ideological justification for the actions that it conducts at the international stage. When the truth of the matter is that the US Empire has no real goals or convictions, i.e. claiming to spread freedom and democracy while backing 70% of the world's dictatorships. It gives zero fucks about any of the things it claims to care about, such as democracy or human rights, i.e. the fact that we are close allies with Saudi Arabia and the State of Israel. It doesn't follow through on any of the promises that it makes to other nations if doing so is too inconvenient for them, i.e. violating the terms of the original post-war agreements to allow the Koreans to form their own governments and then leaving thereafter. It doesn't meaningly follow any of its own rules that it expects other nations to follow unless it's convenient for them to do so, i.e. maintaining a huge nuclear arsenal that it routinely threatens other countries with despite being a part of the NPT. It has zero qualms with betraying the trust and good faith of other sovereign nations if it means profiting from their demise, i.e. Gaddafi honoring the United States and NATO's demands to peacefully lay down his military, only for them to turn around and bomb his country and murder him regardless. And it doesn't have any real meaningful allegiances with any of its other ally countries either, i.e. Saddam Hussein immediately going from our best friends to mortal enemy the microsecond he decided to nationalize Iraqi oil fields. From the lens of liberal naivete, it certainly seems like the United States of America is a hypocritical, bumbling, and incompetent world power, yet still well-intentioned nonetheless. It's the traditional Chomskyite narrative, being though the outcomes of American involvement in a given country never end well, that any atrocities such as the Iraq War are mere accidental miscalculations by an otherwise well-intentioned actor doing what it does in good faith. Liberals will go out of the way to paint neocon figures such as George W. Bush as incompetent buffoons and point to the apparently irrational nature of their decisions as evidence of their incompetence and stupidity, when the truth is that nobody kills and impoverishes millions of people and destabilizes entire continental swaths of the globe by accidents. I assure you, these decisions are highly deliberate and carried out in a carefully coordinated and well thought out manner. These decisions might not make sense from a pro-human standpoint, but they make perfect sense from a profit-maximizing standpoint. In the grand scheme of things, the US Empire is motivated by two things and two things alone. The preservation of global capitalism and the maximization of profit margins of the transnational bourgeoisie. This is the real reason why the US Empire cannot allow socialism, communism, state capitalism, or even social democracy to succeed, because in doing so it would trigger a second domino effect, akin to what happened after the Bolsheviks seized power in Russia and beat the Nazis after World War II. That is to say, we would see a quick resurgence of communist revolutions and the proliferation of world socialism once more. The imperialists know this and so they must crush socialism and communism wherever and whenever it arises, and then use its failure as a propaganda tool in order to fearmonger and manipulate the general first world populace into believing that there just isn't an alternative to the capitalist status quo. The second reason why the US Empire cannot let North Korea alone has to do with the fact that the DPRK is an incredibly resource-rich nation. Within the mountains of the northern peninsula resides billions of tons worth of mineral wealth in the form of gold, coal, copper, zinc, and various rare earth minerals as well. For this reason, Korea has historically been recognized as a massive treasure trove with trillions of dollars worth of mineral wealth ripe for exploitation. Mineral wealth that is now locked away from the imperialists forever, as it is now the common heritage of the people of North Korea. And as I have repeatedly demonstrated throughout the course of this documentary, reactionaries are incredibly sore losers and behave like spoiled children in the face of defeat.
Since at this point, the Imperialists cannot exploit and profit from those mineral resources themselves, they have decided to see to it that neither can the people of the DPRK. Hence the technological embargo and the harshest sanctions in history, preventing them from being able to export and exploit and profit from it. This is why I am a critical supporter of the DPRK. Foreign policy-wise, in comparison to the United States, North Korea's actions on an international stage are incredibly benign and inconsequential, on top of the fact that they have historically and to this day stand in solidarity with actual resistance movements that are actually fighting for liberation, freedom, and democracy. Unlike the United States, which is the number one perpetrator of fascism globally, and contrary to the popular narrative about a paranoid regime hell-bent on global destruction. They're not the ones invading and bombing countries left and right, and actively trying to hold back the human species. And in the face of the ruthless economic warfare and the constant threat of invasion, the fact that they are still capable of simultaneously maintaining a military strong enough to protect itself, while at the same time providing a respectable quality of life to its citizenry, is nothing short of a goddamn miracle. As the DPRK has demonstrably better living standards when in comparison to most of the liberated capitalist third world, boasting a higher human development index than most of the countries of similar economic parity within its region. It is arguably the last socialist country on earth besides Cuba. It is for all intents and purposes the legitimate government of the entirety of Korea, and its very existence is both a testimony of defiance and an active threat against global imperialism. They are living proof that against all odds, a better society is possible, and that we don't have to live under the system that we do. In the end, when climate change ravages the world, when the coastlines of every shore rise and envelop the land, when the planet gets four degrees hotter, triggering waves of mass extinctions as well as waves of migrations northward, as hundreds of millions of third world people are rendered climate refugees from the destabilization that follows suit, when global capitalism collapses amidst the ongoing economic crisis, when the world falls into chaos and the apocalypse is upon us, the DPRK will have civilization. For they have proven time and time again to be a country of highly resilient and resourceful people who have survived a number of trials and tribulations that would have caused any other country on earth to collapse. Could you imagine if America was cut from the rest of the world to even a fraction of the degree that the DPRK has? Imagine if we couldn't have India or China as our global workshop. The United States would be in shambles within two to three months' time. Otherwise, if the DPRK can survive global imperialism, it will, in all likelihood, survive global imperialism. That is long enough to see its downfall along with the end of world capitalism as we know it. In the end, the DPRK is here to stay.
don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, baby. <laughs>